disbursement of funds to constituencies and establish structures for efficient and prudent management of the fund. The other new bill expected in the House this afternoon is the Kenya Roads Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 13 of the year 2021. This one speaks to amendments to the Kenya Roads Act Number 2 of the year 2007, and it will be to align it with provisions of the Constitution regarding auditing functions of the Office of the Auditor General. And it is anchored on the premise that the Act currently refers to the defunct Office of the Control of Budget and the Auditor General. Also listed in the order paper this afternoon, a number of questions. One, an ordinary question from the member of parliament for Kajado North, Honorable Joseph Manje. He's seeking answers from the Cabinet Secretary ICT Innovation and Youth Affairs, and he wants an update on the status of implementation of the Kenya National Addressing System under the Communications Authority, and which involves physical and electronic naming and numbering of buildings and streets. As you can see on your screen, uh, the setup right there is in place, and that is the position that will be occupied by the Cabinet Secretary, National Treasury and Planning, Ukuriatani, who's already within the presence of Parliament, having arrived about 10 minutes ago, and of course was received by members of the House Leadership, Honorable Amos Kimunya, a leader of majority, and Honorable John Badi, leader of minority. It is Budget Day, a live broadcast brought to you by the Parliamentary Broadcasting Unit in conjunction with the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. My name is Vereso Mwanga, and on behalf of the entire crew, I welcome you to follow the proceedings, a sitting that will be presided over by the Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Justin Muturi, who is already in the chambers. Good afternoon. Let us pray. Almighty God, who in wisdom and goodness have appointed the office of leaders and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of the people, we beseech you to behold with your burden favor as your servants whom you've been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in this republic. Let your blessings descend upon us here assembled and grant that we treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote your honor and glory and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of our country and of those whose interests are committed to our charge. Amen. Order number one, 
administration of oath. Order number two, communication from the chair. Order number three, messages. Order number four, petitions. Honourable members, pursuant to the standing order number 225, subsection 2, paragraph B, I wish to report to the House that I have received a petition from Messrs. D.G. Jiao and L.R. Ngure on behalf of several other ex Kenya Air Force officers who were dismissed in 1982. Honourable members, the petitioners claim to have diligently served the nation through the Kenya Air Force until the 1st of August 1982 attempted coup, following which they were arrested for allegedly participating in the attempted coup. They further claim to have been imprisoned for periods spanning six months to several years and thereafter unlawfully and unconstitutionally dismissed from the Kenya Air Force without compensation, despite not having been involved in the attempted coup. Honourable members, <coughs> The petitioner state that they pursued justice through the High Court of Kenya and the courts granted them varying awards on different dates from, the, from 2012 onwards. The petitioners aver that they obtained certificates of decrease, taxation, and orders against the government to be paid in the year 2017. In spite of the fact that the Principal Secretary for Defense so an affidavit on oath averring that the ministry had factored the decretal amounts in the 2017-2018 budget to settle the compensation. The orders remain unheeded several years later. They are therefore worried that since most of their colleagues are senior citizens aged above 65 years and enough no capacity to fend for themselves, any further delay to be compensated will worsen their deteriorating conditions of life. Honourable members, the petitioners are therefore praying that the National Assembly allocate to the Ministry of Defence such funds necessary in the 2021-2022 financial year for compensation and settlement of decreto debts and the interest accrued thereof to the ex-Kenya Air Force officers who were dismissed in 1982. Honourable members, having determined that the matters raised by the petitioners are well within the authority of this House, I order that pursuant to the provisions of standing order 227, the petition be committed to the Budget and Appropriations Committee. The committee is required to consider the petition and report its findings to the House and the petitioners in accordance with the provisions of standing order 227, subsection 2. The committee may also consider proposing necessary adjustments to the 2021-2022 budget for the relevant vote or votes so as to accommodate the prayers of the petitioners should they find them uh, being capable of being accommodated. I thank you, no members. members, in view of uh, the business ahead, I will uh, dispense with the requirement for, to allow members to comment for 30 minutes on that petition. So the, the petition was just start committing to the Committee on Budget. Let's proceed. Order number five, papers. Leader of Majority Party. Uh, Honorable Speaker. I beg to clear the following papers on the table of the House today, Thursday, June the 10th, 2021, in the afternoon sitting. One, the reports on the Auditor General and financial statement for the Kenya Vac Veterinary Vaccines uh, Production Institute for the year ended 30th of June, 2015, 2017, and 2018, and the certificates therein. Number two, the reports of the Auditor General and financial statements in respect to the following institutions uh, for the year ended 30th of June 2020, and the certificates therein. 
the State Department for Youth Affairs, the Public Service Commission, the State Department for Development of the Arid and Semi-Arid Lands, ASALS, the National Government Constituencies Development Fund Board, Development Revenue Statements from the National Treasury, Revenue Statements of the Government Investment and Public Enterprises from the National Treasury, the East Africa Tourist Visa Collection Account from the National Treasury, the Government Clearing Agency Fund, the National Exchequer Account from the National Treasury, Office of the Controller of Budget uh, Mortgage Fund, Stores and Services Fund from the State Department of Public Works, uh, Consolidated Fund Services, Pension and Gratuities from the National Treasury, Mechanical and Transport Fund from the National Youth Service, and the State Department for Public Works. Uh, lastly, number three, the County Government Budget Implementation Review Report for the first nine months of the financial year 2020-2021. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Next order. Order number six, notices of motion. Order number seven, questions and statements. First segment, questions. The first question is by the member for... The Secretary provided a status report on the investigations into an accident that occurred on 5th May 2021 near Pangani Girls High School along Juja Road involving an ambulance registration number KCY015S belonging to Medhill Group of Hospitals, which led to death of Peter Odor of National ID 21764388. Two, could the Cabinet Secretary undertake to ensure that the matter will be fully investigated with a view of ensuring justice for the victims for the victims and compensation for the life lost. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right. Question will be replied to before the Departmental Committee on Administration and National Security. Last question by the member for Saboti, Honorable Caleb Amisi. He had indicated that he had given authority to the Honorable Jaguar to ask on his behalf. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise on behalf of Honorable Caleb Amisi to ask question 183 of 2021 to the Cabinet Secretary for Defense. One, could the Cabinet Secret Secretary elaborate the steps the Ministry is taking, if any, to ensure the suc successful rescue of Gerishon W. Wasike, a member of the Kenyan Defense Forces, KDF number 64809, who was taken hostage in 2006 by the Al-Shabaab terror group in Somalia? Two, could the Cabinet Secretary explain the government policy regarding the rescue of Kenya prisoners of war? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's to 2016, not 2006. 2016. That's what uh, it reads. Very well, the question will be replied to before the Departmental Committee on Defense and Foreign Relations. I can see somebody was placed an intervention member for Dagoretti South. What's your intervention about? Mr. Speaker, this is uh, uh, unintended. Thank you very much. Good work. Member for Moyen, what's your intervention about? Nothing. Honorable Speaker. There could be a problem with the system because <laughs> uh, my gadget here doesn't show anything. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Any other, any other intervention? Whether intended or unintended? <laughs> Member for Garissa, is it intended or unintended? Speaker, mine is uh, intended. Speaker, Two and a half months ago, I seek a statement from the chair, chairperson of Energy Committee on the matter of uh, independent power producers 
and their role in the high electricity bill. Speaker, I'm yet to get a reply from the committee. And Speaker, I urge you to direct that uh, in our next sitting on Tuesday, the committee should furnish the House with all the information because, Speaker, I asked for a written statement. But the statement I got, Speaker, had five fundamental questions. And two of the questions, and I'm sure the clerk has a copy of that statement, two of the questions, question four and five, the committee asked that I should go to court and get a court order so that they can, the minister can furnish me with the specific directors of the, of the companies that, pro, that provide power to KPLC, 13 of them. And uh, secondly, they will not avail the contractual obligation showing how much each company was paid per month. And the speaker, in line with Article 125 of the Constitution and the Powers and Privilege Act and Article 35 of the Constitution on access to information, a committee of this House, when it demands for information from the executive or any other arm of government, that information must be provided. So, Mr. Speaker, this is a matter of national interest. And when I saw that statement, Mr. Speaker, the same evening, the executive formed a task force very, very, uh, very, in a very unusual manner. But I am, as a member of parliament, I am under obligation to provide to the people of Kenya the cost of power vis-a-vis -vis what this independent power produces, private independent power produces. How much do they charge KPLC, and how much does that translate to the price ordinary citizens and investors pay? So, Mr. Speaker, I really want to you to use your powers to ask the chair of the Energy Committee to supply me with the information so that the House, together with the House, they, we can interrogate the matter, Mr. Speaker. It is now two months. Well, the chair of uh, the particular committee on uh, energy, the member for Nakuru Town East, the member of Ikaria, who deputizes him, who's the vice chair. As you can see, both the, the chairperson, the vice chairperson, uh, are absent, not desiring to be present on this momentous day. I don't, I don't know how they, how can they be absent? How can the chairperson be absent on, the, on a day like today, surely? Maybe, maybe they should have come here. The, the, the house was sitting yesterday, so they cannot be saying to be on the way from their villages. The, me the member who is uh, raising his hand up there. Are you, would you want to speak on behalf of the chairperson or on behalf of the vice chair? Or on your own behalf? Is that Honorable Osman? What? Ah, okay. Very well, very well. Um, your concerns are noted and um, the little majority will convey the, that um, Message, but um, let me bring the statement on uh, Tuesday. It has taken too long. I can see an intervention from the member for Uriri. Onabonyamita. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on the 13th of May, I did ask a question directed to the 
Departmental Committee on uh, Defense and Foreign Relations. My question had to do with compensation of one of their ex-members of the Kenya Defense Forces who had not been compensated for now over 25 years. And Mr. Speaker, you directed that question be under the chair then, I think, under Bukateo Lemetito, uh, agreed to bring feedback to this house in two weeks. Mr. Speaker, to date, we are heading towards the end of June, and uh, we have not heard from them. They have not come back to this house to even come and seek for additional time. I'm seeking your intervention so that they probably fast track this because the people on whose behalf I was petitioning are waiting for this uh, feedback. You, you, you've had the petition which you have just read out. Perhaps it, it, could, be, it could be addressed in, the, in that petition, is it? Uh, but well, certainly, well certainly if it could, be, it could be covered also because mine was specific and I gave out all the details. So if they could address us, probably they are responding to this. Uh, I would appreciate it. Although the question was really not directed to the chairman, it was directed to the, minister, the cabinet secretary. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Mr. Speaker, I was indeed very glad when you referred that uh, petition to the Budget and Appropriation Committee because we have, uh, you know, a long list of um, ex-army officers uh, who are having such claims as alluded to by uh, the Honorable uh, Nyamita. But, but Mr. Speaker, it's also good to note that um, these cases, because they all ended up being in court, uh, from the court martial to the high court, and uh, you know, high court actually uh, cleared those officers, awarded them uh, uh, those um, you know damages. But uh, when you inquire from the government, especially from the Ministry of Defence and uh, specifically from the Attorney General Office. They say there is a pending appeal. Government had appealed for such um, judgment. And there are so many, so many. And they actually could lose some sum of money, a lot of money, that were awarded to those ex-officers, ex-army officers. So now going to the Budget Committee, it is the Budget Committee that has got powers in this House to do appropriation. So the case of uh, the Honorable Nyamita, I'm very sure it will be covered there, where the Budget Committee will look into um, the judgment of the High Court and whether there is any live uh, appeal in the Court of Appeal on the same matter, and then they will make an informed decision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Maybe the Honorable Nyamita will, uh, can also pursue uh, with the Budget and Appropriations Committee. Uh, but certainly, and the Honorable Nyamita say that uh, since he raised the question on the 13th of May, uh, it is now towards the end of June. But certainly, 10th of June cannot be towards the end. It is not towards the Honorable Nyamita. 10th of June cannot be towards the end of June. But, but uh, nevertheless, uh, your, your concern is noted. Yes, Honorable Nyamita. Mr. Speaker, whereas I appreciate the feedback from the Chair of Defense and Foreign Relations, I think it would be justice if the committee at least looked into the matter instead of generalizing and saying that I think you know, in this house, you know, the chair cannot come and say, I think that petition when we have, they are, uh, <laughs> they are seized of that very question that I asked. They need to find out the details. If then uh, it requires the intervention of the Budget and Appropriations Committee, uh, Mr. Speaker, where I also sit, then he will bring it. But to just uh, dismiss it without even having the benefit of looking at it, uh, I think we might be directing it to the wrong committee because mine was not exactly as a petition that you had earlier raised. So I just want to urge that probably they look into it, they find out facts, because it is them who can be able to tell us whether 
the respective department has lodged an appeal. Instead of the Budget and Appropriations Committee, we will not be in a position to go and check whether, so that is the work of the committee, then they can direct it to. You can, you can get that. Honorable Katolo, Mitito, can you bring on Thursday a specific response as to whether or not, uh, in respect to the question raised by the Honorable Nyamita, whether the state did uh, appeal? And if they did, the status of the appeal uh, for the comfort of the Honorable Member. By Thursday. Yes, Mr. Speaker, uh, Honorable Nyamito, my good friend, knows very well that this is a very, very serious committee. From 13th May, we just came back uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, we resumed uh, on 8th. And I, uh, so we haven't really failed to bring it on time, but I will go for, with your direction, Mr. Speaker, Thursday next week. We will, uh, we will respond to Honorable Nyambita's uh, statement. Uh, but I, I was not really thinking, I'm, I'm being told uh, by my good friend here, the member for Kiambu, that uh, I'm not allowed to think. But, uh, but, but Mr. Speaker, I, I am very certain that uh, the end game for all these petitions on ex-army officers is a consolidated the petition to be decided by the Budget and Appropriation Committee. But nevertheless, I will respond as directed by you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Nominated member Osotsi, you have an intervention. What is it about? Mr. Speaker, just like uh, my good friend, uh, Hone Bonyamita, I did ask a question here, I think in April, touching on KRA and revenue performance. Mr. Speaker, the question was directed to Finance and Planning Committee. I am concerned because it's taking too, too long for me to get an answer. So I would seek your intervention so that the committee can invite KRA to come and respond to the issues that I had raised in that question, Mr. Speaker. Chair of Budget, Honorable Wanga. Finance, sorry, finance. Finance uh, and planning. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I'm, I'm really surprised uh, by the Honorable Sotsi because I have been in constant communication with him. He himself came to me and he told me when we had invited KRA to come and respond that he was not going to be available to come and listen to the answer to that question, Honorable Speaker. And he asked me to postpone it indefinitely until he's available. So I'm really surprised for the Honorable Sotsi to come and mention this on the floor as if the committee has not moved on the matter. The Honorable Speaker, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. So Honorable Speaker, I'm really surprised. I invited KRA, KRA were ready to come. Honorable Sotsi approached me. He told me he was not available on the, on the day and that I should postpone it until a date that he is available. I am just waiting for him to come back and tell me when he is available. So, Honorable Speaker, to come and raise the matter here on the floor and to make the committee look uh, incompetent is, not, is out of order, Honorable Speaker. I, re I, re I request the Honorable Speaker to find him out of order. And, if he, and he had better just be quiet. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Sotsi, you know, you know, what has been said by the Chair of Finance is the staff that uh, should see you walk be thrown out of the chamber because uh, it is not fair. It's not fair that you can, go, you can approach the Chair of the Committee to postpone your question and then come to complain here. Is that so? Because as she says, then your hands will look extremely dirty. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> I want to be very clear. Yes, indeed, I've been in, in touch with the Chair of Finance. And uh, yes, at some point, I said I was not going to be available uh, because I was going to be out of town. But I never said that the question should not be asked. So I will be more than willing for the committee to uh, still invite the respondent to respond to the question. So I never say to, to 
to put the committee, to, put, to cast aspersions actually on the committee that they are sitting on your question. And that's the, the, the point, the, the point make, being made by the Honorable Wanga is you approached her to postpone the question. And she says she was waiting for you now to go back and say when it is you are available. Now you come, you come here and start saying that the, the, question, the, the committee has not responded. Yeah, actually, you should actually, you should actually apologize to the committee. Honorable Sotsi, apologize to the committee. Apologize to the committee. Mr. Speaker, um, it's uh, very clear that uh, I've been in touch with the Chair of Finance, whom I respect a lot. Uh, it's only that at one point I was not available, and I'm sorry for all that confusion. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, through your intervention, I would still uh, request that uh, if opportunity is available, I would very be very keen to get responses to my question, Mr. Speaker. In, same, in the same way, you approach her, go and approach her to set a date for the question to be answered. I think, honourable members, let's, let's proceed with business. This, this, you can see now, members think it's an occasion for, I don't know what's the cause for excitement. Because you can see, you, you, you may have forgotten because of the long holiday. You see, the honourable sort say, forgot he is the one who requested for the postponement of the question. Uh, Honorable Jaldesa, what's your intervention about? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I had earlier pressed uh, an intervention before he apologized. I oh, appreciate it. Very well. Leader Majority. Yeah, he has apologized. <laughs> Uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, pursuant to the provisions of studying order number 442A, I uh, arise to give the following statement on behalf of the House Business Committee, which met on Monday, 7th of June, 2021, to prioritize the business for consideration. Honourable Speaker, I wish to officially welcome members back uh, from their media recess that was held from 13th of May, 2021, to 7th of June, 2021. It allowed departmental committees to consider and discuss the budget estimates for the financial year 2021-2022 uh, with the relevant uh, government ministries and state departments and other government institutions according to their respective mandates and make recommendations to the Budget and Appropriations Committee. Honorable Speaker, I'm delighted that Budget and Appropriations Committee has tabled its detailed report for consideration adop and adoption by this August House in accordance with studying order number 235-5. And I wish to commend the committees for their diligence in finalizing their work within the tight time frames. I'm also happy that committee chairs and members have begun making their contributions on the floor of the House regarding the budget estimates. Honorable Speaker, today we welcome the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury and Planning as he makes a public pronouncement of the budget highlights and revenue-raising measures for the government for the fiscal year 2021-2022 in accordance with studying orders number 25AA and 244C. 244C. Honorable Speaker, during the afternoon sitting of Tuesday next week, we shall have the following bills being read the first time. Number one, the Trustees Perpetual Succession Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill number 23 of 2021. The Perpetual Perpetuities and Accumulations Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill number 24 of 2021. And the Certified Managers Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 26 of 2021. Honourable Speaker, we shall also continue consideration of the report on the budget estimates for the financial year 2021-2022 for the third and final allotted day. Once this is concluded, the House shall continue debate on the motion on the report of the Auditor General of Financial Statements for the National Government for the financial year 2017-2018. Honourable Speaker. Members will recall that we amended the calendar of the House to hold evening sittings on Tuesdays and Wednesdays starting from next week until our next recess in July. As such, during the evening session of Tuesday, 15th of June 2021, that is the session beginning from 7 to 9.30 p.m., we have scheduled the following business for consideration. Number one, in the Committee of Supply, 
in accordance with the procedure provided for in studying order number 241. Two, the second reading of the Wakfu Bill, National Assembly Bill number 73 of 2019, and number three, a motion on the report of the Department, Departmental Committee on Finance and National Planning on the inspection visit to ascertain the impact of revenue enhancement initiatives on revenue collection. Honorable Speaker, due to the tightness of the business for the week, I'm informed that there are no questions scheduled for response by cabinet secretaries next week. Uh, Honorable Speaker, the House Business Committee will reconvene on Tuesday the 15th of June uh, 2021 to schedule the business for the rest of the week. I now wish to lay this statement on the table of the House. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Very well. Next order. Order number eight, the National Government Constituencies Development Fund Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill number four of 2021. First reading. A bill for an act of parliament to amend the National Government Constituencies Development Act 2015. Next. Order number nine, the Kenya Roads Amendment Bill, National Assembly Bill number 13 of 2021. First reading. A bill for an act of parliament to amend the Kenya Roads Act and for connected purposes. That's all. General, one of our members, this is communication number 27 of 2021 which uh, deals with interruption of business for delivery of the highlights of budget estimates for the financial year 2021-2022. Honourable members, as you are aware, this week the House has been considering the report of the Budget and Appropriations Committee on the budget estimates for the national government, parliament, and the judiciary for the financial year 2021-2022. This process will, will proceed to the Committee of Supply, which will allocate funds to various votes and programs under the three arms of the national government. Ultimately, the process comes to an end upon the passage and enactment of the Annual Appropriations Act, which anchors the respective allocations in law and authorizes the attendant withdrawals from the consolidated fund. Honourable members, as part of this process, Section 40, Subsection 1 of the Public Finance Management Act of 2012, ran together with Standing Order 244, Paragraph C, requires the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury to make a public pronouncement of the budget highlights and revenue raising measures of the national government. For this reason, I have shortly been interrupting business of the House to allow the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury and planning to discharge this obligation. Honourable members, before I do so, allow me to recognize the following cabinet secretaries who are sitting in the speaker's row for this occasion, being led as of time we are sitting, Mr. James Masharia, EGH Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Professor Margaret Cobia, EGH Cabinet Secretary for Public Service, uh, Mrs. Cecily Kariuki, Cabinet Secretary for Water, and several other dignitaries. <laughs> they, are welcome, they are welcome to the National Assembly. Honourable members, I also wish to recognize the Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Jiroge, as well as representatives from the judiciary led by the Com Commissioner Evelyn Olwande, who's accompanied, who's accompanied by the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary, Mrs. Anne Amandi, and other judicial officers, and are pleased they are seated in the diplomatic boxes. Honourable members, seated at the public servants' benches 
our other distinguished guests from the National Treasury accompanying the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon. They include the Chief Administrative Secretary, National Treasury, the Honorable Nelson Gaishuye, the Chief Administrative Secretary Planning, Mr. Eric Simio Wafuho, and the Principal Secretary, National Treasury, Dr. Julius Muya. Finally, may I also recognize our very own Mrs. Phyllis Macau, the Director of the Parliamentary Budget Office, who is also seated at the public servants' benches. Please, me, please join me, members, in welcoming them to the National Assembly this afternoon in our usual manner. Honourable members, paragraph A of standing order 255, capital A provides and I, as follows, and I quote, the speaker may designate a suitable place in the chamber or at the bar of the house for A, the cabinet secretary responsible for finance to make a public pronouncement of the budget policy highlights and revenue raising measures for the national government as contemplated under the Public Finance Management Act, close the quote. In furtherance of this provision, I have designated a suitable place to the right of Mr. Speaker's seat and adjacent to the public servants' benches to enable the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury and planning to discharge his obligation under Section 40 of the Public Finance Management Act 2012 and Standing Order 244C of the National Assembly Standing Orders. In this regard, honourable members, it is now my pleasure to invite the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury and, National, and, and Planning, the Honorable Ambassador Uko Riyatani, to make a public pronouncement of the budget highlights and the revenue-raising measures for the national government for the financial year 2021-2022 and the medium term, not later than 3.15 p.m. When a Cabinet Secretary Karibu. Mr. Speaker, it is once again a privilege for me to present to this honorable house and the people of Kenya highlights of the budget policy and the revenue raising measures for the financial year 2021-22. This statement is a fulfillment of the requirement of section 40 of the Public Finance Management Act and the standing order number 241 of the National Assembly. I do this in performing my fiduciary duty to Kenyans. Before I proceed with the rest of the, my statement, Mr. Speaker, allow me to say that during the preparation of this budget, I had very fruitful engagements with the diverse stakeholders and received valuable feedback. The breadth of the stakeholders span from the government ministries, departments and agencies, county government, committees of this house, development partners, private sector, and Kenyans from all walks of life. I extend my sincere gratitude to them for their views and useful suggestions which inform the priorities of this budget. Mr. Speaker, pressing concerns raised by Kenyans during the consultation process revolved around the impact of COVID-19 and its containment measures. Kenyans were concerned about the high cost of COVID-19 treatment and availability of vaccines, in addition to food security, high cost of living, and employment levels among the youth. In addition, Kenyans raised concerns about the general levels of poverty and inequality, as well as increased public debt. Mr. Speaker, at the outset, I wish to assure Kenyans that these concerns have been considered and I will be elaborating specific interventions later in this statement. Mr. Speaker, 
As you recall, following the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in March last year, the government instituted containment measures to curb the spread of the virus and save lives. To cushion Kenyans and businesses, the government rolled out specific fiscal interventions, including reduction of pay as yuan and corporate tax from 30 to 25 percent, value added tax from 16 to 14 percent, and turnover tax from 3 to 1 percent. The government also offered 100 percent tax relief to Kenyans earning below Kenya shilling 24,000 per month. In addition, the government enhanced cash transfer allocations to the vulnerable segment of the society, including the emerging urban vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, the government further implemented various monetary policy measures to enhance access to credit by the private sector. This included a reduction of the central bank rate from 8.25 to 7 percent and lowering of the cash reserve ratio from 5.2 to 4.2 percent thereby injecting an additional cash shilling 35 billion to the money market. Further, during this period, commercial banks were allowed to flexibility with regard to requirements for loan classification and provisioning. Mr. Speaker, to spur economic activities in the country, the government implemented a comprehensive economic stimulus program targeting activities in infrastructure, education, health, business liquidity, agriculture and food security, tourism, manufacturing, environment, water and sanitation. Mr. Speaker, in spite of these interventions, a lot remains to be done in order to deal with the challenges of unemployment among our youth, as well as high, high poverty and income equality levels that have been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our rallying call in this year's budget is therefore job creation through continued and sustained economic growth. To strengthen this position, we shall implement comprehensive economic recovery strategy that will expand economic activities and address these challenges. Mr. Speaker, the private sector remains key to employment creation and poverty reduction in the country. In order to expand the scope and pace of policy interventions and enhance access to credit by businesses, the government established the credit guarantee scheme to the risk lending to the micro, small, and medium enterprises. Mr. Speaker, the plight of the vulnerable in our society, particularly the emerging urban vulnerable, remains a key concern for our government. In order to cushion this particular group, the government will enhance cash transfer allocations and institute other targeted interventions in this budget. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered one of the worst health and economic crises of our time. The pandemic overstretched our health systems, and in line with the advisory of the World Health Organization, the government implemented appropriate interventions to save lives. The response has undoubtedly strengthened our health care system through provisioning of necessary medical supplies, installation of modern equipment, and deployment of more health personnel. In addition, in March 2021, the government launched the National COVID-19 Vaccination Program initially targeting the frontline workers and other highly vulnerable groups. As at end of May 2021, about one million persons had received the first do uh, vaccine dose. In order to facilitate further rollout of vaccines to create herd immunity, we propose to allocate Kenya shilling 14.3 billion in the financial 2021-22. This is in addition to Kenya shilling 7.6 billion appropriated in the current budget. Mr. Speaker, to enhance access to affordable medical and equipment for management of COVID-19 and chronic diseases, I will let in this statement be proposing tax relief measures on the various pharmaceutical products and, and medical equipment. Mr. Speaker, the containment measures instituted by the government to stem the spread of the virus and save lives adversely affected economic activities and revenue performance. To stimulate economic activities and enhance government's ability to respond we prioritized health and social expenditures and formulated an economic recovery strategy program that targeted, first, enhancing our ability to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, second, reducing debt vulnerabilities through a revenue-driven fiscal consolidation with a view to stabilizing debt-to-GDP ratio over the medium term, third, 
implementing targeted policy, legal and institutional reforms, while at the same time addressing vulnerabilities in the state-owned enterprises worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. And fourth, strengthening the monetary policy framework and financial stability. Mr. Speaker, under this program, we plan to reduce the level of fiscal deficit from 8.7% of GDP in the current budget to 7.5% of GDP in the financial 2021-22, and further to 3.6% of GDP in the financial year 2024-25. This will be a 5.1% reduction in fiscal deficit over the next four years, thereby slowing the annual growth of debt. Upon our request, this economic recovery program is supported by multilateral and bilateral development partners with the International Monetary Fund providing financial resources amounting to US dollars 2.34 billion over the next three years. Further, Mr. Speaker, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the G20 countries extended support to developing countries by offering debt service suspension under the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative Framework. The fiscal space created under this initiative is to increase social, health, and economic spending in response to, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Kenya has benefited from this initiative through expansion of health and social services. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, Kenya welcomes the initiatives under the recent French-African Summit that agreed to, among others, increase funding through the IMF special drawing rights to African states to support economic recovery, extension of the G20 debt service suspension, and facilitate the manufacture of vaccines in Africa. Mr. Speaker, I will now highlight the economic policy context in which this budget has been prepared. Mr. Speaker, this year's budget has been prepared against a backdrop of projected global economic recovery. This is despite the emergence of COVID-19 variant occasioning reintroduction of containment measures to further stem the spread of the virus. The projected recovery reflects additional fiscal support in a few large economies and monetary easing that further uplifts the economic outlook. This outlook is further supported by the ongoing vaccinations, which is expected to pick up in the second half of 2021. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, the global economy is projected to grow by 6% in 2021 from a contraction of 3.3% in 2020. Mr. Speaker, close to home, due to improved exports and commodity prices, economic growth in the sub-Saharan Africa region is projected to expand by 3.4% in 2021 from a contraction of 1.9% in 2020. This growth will also be supported by recovery in both private consumption and investment as the economy is reopened. Mr. Speaker, like the rest of the world, our economy was not spared from the adverse impact of the pandemic. In addition, the Kenyan economy experienced two other shocks. One, the invasion of the desert, the desert locusts that damaged crops, and two, floods that caused loss of lives and livelihoods, displacement of people, and destruction of infrastructure. Given the impact of these shocks, economic growth for 2020 declined to 0.6% from 5.4% in, in 2019. Mr. Speaker, economic growth is, is expected to rebound to 6.6% in 2021. This recovery reflects the lower base of 2020, when most services sectors were adversely affected by the closure of the economy, uh, recording negative growth. The outlook in 2021 will be reinforced by the prevailing stable macroeconomic environment and the ongoing implementation of the strategic priorities of government under the Big Four agenda and economic recovery strategy. Weather conditions are expected to be favorable, supporting agricultural output. As a result, export of goods and services will expand as global demand normalizes. Over the medium term, the economy is expected to remain resilient and grow at a rate above 6.1%. Mr. Speaker, this growth outlook is affirmed by the recent surveys by the Monetary Policy Committee revealing a general optimism about economic growth prospects. In addition, the recent IMF mission to Kenya noted that economic recovery is underway and estimates economic growth consistent with our projections. Mr. Speaker, to support this growth outlook, we shall continue to maintain macroeconomic stability. 
Inflation, which stood at 5.9% in May 2021, is expected to remain within the target range of 5%, with a margin of 2.5 on either side, supported by prudent fiscal and monetary policies. Interest rates will be expected to remain low and stable, supporting growth of private sector credit. The balance of payments is also expected to be strong, with the current account balance projected to remain at 5.2% of GDP. Further, the rebound in horticulture and tea exports, as well as increased inflows of remittances, will support build-up of adequate levels of official foreign exchange reserves, creating buffers against short-term shocks in the foreign exchange market. Mr. Speaker, the affirmation economic outlook may be affected by emerging domestic and external risks. The emergence of the new, of new COVID-19 variant could lead to resettlement of continuing measures, disrupting among other trade and tourism. In addition, Mr. Speaker, adverse weather conditions could lead to low agricultural output. Further, increased public expenditure pressures, particularly wage demands, could put a strain to the fiscal space. Mr. Speaker, the government will continue to monitor these developments and take appropriate policy interventions to safeguard the economy while the risks to materialize. Mr. Speaker, having outlined the economic policy context for this budget, we have carefully reflected on a theme that will resonate with our strategies to protect lives and livelihoods during this period of COVID-19, cushion the vulnerable and support economic recovery for employment creation and poverty reduction. In this respect, we have framed the theme for this budget as building back better, a strategy for resilient and sustainable economic recovery and inclusive growth. Mr. Speaker, the next section of my statement will give highlights of the policy priorities of the government and the strategy for economic recovery. I will later provide highlights of the fiscal framework underpinning the budget, spending priorities, and the proposed tax policy measures. Mr. Speaker, the implementation of Big Four agenda remains a high priority and critical to, macro, uh, to the economic recovery. In this regard, the government will fast track implementation of programs and projects under the Big Four agenda to enhance food and nutritional security, achieve universal health care, provide affordable housing, and support growth of the manufacturing sector for job creation. Mr. Speaker, the government will also undertake the strategic interventions to achieve a resilient and sustainable economic recovery. First, maintain a macroeconomic stability and enhance security to foster a secure and conducive business environment and security of Kenyans and their properties. Second, scale up development of critical infrastructure in the country such as roads, rail, energy, and water to reduce the cost of doing business and ease movement of people and goods, as well as promote competitiveness. Third, enhance investment in key economic sectors for broad-based sustainable recovery by promoting agricultural transformation, growth in manufacturing, environmental conservation, and water supply, stimulating tourism recovery, and sustainable land use and management. Fourth, expand access to quality social services in health, education, and appropriate social safety nets for the vulnerable population. Fifth, support the youth, women, and persons living with disability through government-funded em employment programs, empowerment programs that leverages on part partnerships with the private sector organization. Sixth, support county government through transfer of shareable revenues to strengthen their systems and capacity in service delivery, and lastly, implement various policy, legal, and institutional reforms to enhance efficiency of public service delivery. Mr. Speaker, following the outbreak of the pandemic, we implemented the Economic Stimulus Program to support economic activities and mitigate the adverse impact of the pandemic on Kenyans and businesses. The achievement of the program includes, one, creation of over 100,000 jobs opportunities for the youth under the Kazi Mutani Initiative and 5,500 community scouts in wildlife conservation areas across the 47 counties. Two, improvement of education outcomes through construction of additional classrooms in secondary schools, procurement of locally fabricated desks 
for both primary and secondary schools and recruitment of 4,000 and 8,000 primary and secondary school intern teachers, respectively. Three, enhancement of healthcare system capacity by recruiting 5,000 diploma and certificate level health, healthcare workers for one year under the universal health coverage. Four, enhancement of liquidity to businesses through payment of VAT refunds of canceling 10 billion and clearance of pending bills of canceling 13.1 billion. Five, the risking of lending to micro, small, and medium enterprises by providing canceling 3 billion to the credit guarantee scheme as a seed capital. And six, cushioning the vulnerable, particularly the emerging urban vulnerable, with an additional Kenya shilling 10 billion to the cash transfer program. Mr. Speaker, building on the success of the affirmation interventions, the government is now set to implement an elaborate economic recovery strategy that aims to reposition the economy on an inclusive and sustainable growth trajectory. The strategy seeks to enhance resource mobilization to ensure sustainable funding of our development programs from diverse sources, including public-private partnership and lease financing. The strategy will also support the role of the private sector in the economy and further facilitate credit access by micro, small, and medium enterprises through, through the credit guarantee scheme. Under the strategy, the government will upscale investment in ICT and digital infrastructure in order to facilitate e-commerce and efficient delivery of public services. The government shall also promote local production processes and domestic supply value chains and strengthen social protection through targeted policy interventions and programs. Mr. Speaker, undoubtedly, successful implementation of this strategy will enable us to realize the aspired economic growth, create employment, and narrow income inequalities. I will let in this statement proposed budget allocations to the government priority areas. Mr. Speaker, besides the achievements under the economic stimulus program, the ongoing key strategic interventions of government, as well as sustained policy reforms over the years, have greatly transformed the economy and improved the welfare of Kenyans. Mr. Speaker, I will now highlight some of the key achievements realized from these investments and reforms. Mr. Speaker, at the macroeconomic level, our prudent fiscal, monetary, and financial policies have resulted into fast, strong, macro, uh, strong economic growth that averaged at 5.6% between 2013 and 2019. However, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic slowed growth in the year 2020. The GDP per capita increased by an impressive 80.4%, from Kenya shilling 113,000 in 2013 to Kenya shilling 204,000 in 2019. New jobs created by both the formal and the informal sector increased by 12%, from 755,000 in 2013 to 846,000 in 2019. Second, inflation rate has remained within target range, averaging 6.1%. Third, interest rates have declined while credit to the private sector increased. Lending rates declined from 17.3% in 2013 to 12% in 2020, while the central bank rate declined from 8.5% in 2013 to 7% in 2020. As a result, credit to the private sector increased from current shilling 1.5 trillion in 2013 to current shilling 2.8 trillion in 2020. Fourth, the current account deficit improved from 8.8% of GDP in 2013 to 4.7% of GDP in 2020, supporting the stability of the foreign exchange market. And fifth, revenue collection, including appropriation in aid, doubled from Kenya shilling 900 billion in the financial 2013-2014 to an estimated Kenya shilling 1.8 trillion in the financial 2020-21. Mr. Speaker, our investment in the expansion of road networks, railways, seaports, airports, and energy has enhanced domestic and regional connectivity, boosted rural productivity, and reduced urban congestion. These investments include, one, the standard gauge railway and the urban commuter rail in Nairobi, the ongoing rehabilitation of meter gauge railway lines along various routes, including Nairobi Nanyuki and Nakuru Kisumu Butere. Two, 
the recently launched first batch in Lamu port as a critical pillar of the Lapset corridor. Our focus to make Lamu a free port for both domestic and transshipment purposes. In addition, the government is establishing a disease-free zone in Lamu to support export of live animals and processed meat. Three, the rehabilitation and subsequent use of Kisumu port will enhance efficiency in regional trade. And four, expansion in energy generation and connectivity with over 7.5 million households today connected to electricity compared to 2.3 million households in 2013. Mr. Speaker, the government has provided various incentives at our ports, including exempting the fuel supply to the shipping lines from import and excise duty, VAT, as well as railway development levy and import declaration fees. To further attract more ships to our ports, particularly to the recently launched Lamu port, the government will review the arrangements on fueling by vessels calling at, at the Kenyan ports, with a view to allowing ship to ship, refueling and establishment of fuel bunker facilities. Mr. Speaker, in addition to the various reforms in the agricultural sector, we focus on the livestock sector by reviving the Kenya Meat Commission. We shall set up a meat processing plant in Lamu to provide ready market for livestock, increase income to farmers, and enhance the meat value chain. Mr. Speaker, we also focus on increasing fish production by refurbishing Lewatoni fishing complex and setting up a new fish processing plant in Lamu. This will promote exports and increase income for the local fishermen. Mr. Speaker, in order to improve access to land as a factor for development, we have stepped up investment in the sector and rolled out ambitious national program of land titling and digitizing, digitization of land records. Mr. Speaker, tea and coffee subsectors provide livelihoods to millions of Kenyans. Despite its contribution, the foreign exchange earnings, the returns to farmers have been declining due to low productivity, high input cost, low levels of value addition, and weak regulatory and institutional framework. Under the ongoing reforms in the coffee and tea sectors, I'll be proposing further measures to enhance competitiveness of these subsectors. With regard to manufacturing, Mr. Speaker, the government has revived and transformed textile, leather, and automobile industries, which have in turn created jobs for our youth. The full operationalization of special economic zones in Dongokundu, Naivasha, and Kisumu will support local industries, industrial activities, and unlock additional employment opportunities. Mr. Speaker, the government over the years has supported local assembly of motor vehicles and motorcycles by providing various tax incentives. This includes removal of excise duty on locally assembled motor vehicles, duty-free importation of complete knockdown kits, and reduced corporate tax from 30 to 15 percent for the first five years of operation. I am pleased to note that the industry has responded positively to these interventions, and to date, we have approved 13 motor vehicle and 17 motorcycle assemblers. These local assemblers have created employment opportunities while also saving the country substantial foreign exchange. Mr. Speaker, whereas assembly of commercial vehicles have registered tremendous growth, the passenger ca category of motor vehicles remains underdeveloped. This category is still dominated by imported used vehicles, comprising over 70% of passenger vehicles, which is largely attributed to the high cost of assembly. In this regard, the government is working on a framework to support the assembly of affordable passenger vehicles. Further, the government, in consultation with the stakeholders, is in the final stages of instituting comprehensive policy and administrative reforms to fully entrench local assembly of motor vehicles and motorcycles. Mr. Speaker, while we have made tremendous progress as a nation, we remain alert to the structural constraints that impair the pace of economic development. Aware that a resilient and sustainable economic recovery is indeed predicated on timely implementation of appropriate policy, legal, and institutional reforms, I propose the following interventions to improve the business environment, increase efficiency in public service delivery, and strengthen accountability and transparency in public finance management. On procurement, Mr. Speaker, this House approved the procurement 
Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Regulation 2020 that came into effect in July 2020. With this regulation, it's now easier for procuring entities to meet the specified requirements of bilateral and multilateral agreements on technology and knowledge transfer, local content and employment quotas, among others. For smooth implementation of the regulations, we have conducted capacity building in all 47 counties. I therefore direct procuring entities to fully comply with these regulations. Mr. Speaker, in order to ensure efficiency in procurement process and facilitate access by micro, small, and medium enterprises, the government has reviewed consolidation policy on procurement of ICT equipment and related services. In this regard, procurement of ICT equipment and related services will be decentralized to various ministries, departments, and agencies with effect from 1st July 2021. Mr. Speaker, last year, we began the process of automating public procurement through an end-to-end -end electronic procurement system. So far, we have developed an implementation strategy that re-engineers all public procurement processes, including functional and technical requirements. In order to actualize this initiative, 31st December 2021 will be the final date for rolling out the electronic government procurement system and, and therefore disc uh, discontinuation of the manual procurement processes. In this regard, the government will realize savings as a result of greater efficiency, reduced operational costs, enhanced transparency and accountability through increased bidding participation. Mr. Speaker, to support our local contractors and undertake construction of infrastructure projects, we have proposed changes to the contracting framework through the Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Bill 2020. The bill before this House proposes, among others, to allow award of contract to multiple bidders. This, indeed, will support local farms and has raised the delivery of services. Mr. Speaker, given the prevailing business environment due to the adverse impact of COVID-19 pandemic, there's an urgent need to evaluate the financial position and governance of key state corporations and institutions. It is in, the, in this respect that the government is exploring targeted reforms to strengthen these institutions, including public universities. Mr. Speaker, in the interim, the government pro provided financial support to strategic institutions, including Kenya Airways, Kenya Power and Lightning Company, and Postal Corporations of Kenya, which were indeed in their need of cash to meet critical obligations. Mr. Speaker, we have developed a robust information management system to strengthen the statutory role of the National Treasury in financial and operational oversight, as well as the financial risk analysis for state corporations. Mr. Speaker, you may recall that the government introduced cost sharing in public universities in the year 1991. At that time, government funding for public universities per year was set at Kenya shilling 120,000 per student. Of this, government capitation per student was cancelling 70,000, while students contributed cancelling 50,000 through loan funding from Higher Education Loans Board, out of which cancelling 16,000 catered for tuition fees. This is less than half of tuition fees paid currently by students in various colleges of technical and vocational education and training institutions. The ideal cost of training a student in a university has increased from cancelling 120,000 to about cancelling 200,000 per year, and therefore the prevailing funding arrangement introduced in 1991 is unsustainable. Under the current arrangement, universities have not only experienced financial constraints, but have also been unable to continuously honor their structural obligations. Mr. Speaker, in order to ensure sustainability and self-reliance of public universities, the Ministry of Education is expected to engage stakeholders beginning July 2021 with a view to addressing this matter. Mr. Speaker, delays in payment of pending bills to businesses who provide services to both national and county government has affected liquidity and operation of these entities. In a number of cases, this has led to closure of businesses and affected livelihoods of, of the suppliers. Though progressive progress was made in settlement of these bills by the national government, we still have challenges with the county government that still owe various suppliers huge amounts. In this regard, I direct government ministries, departments and agencies, and the county governments to clear all their pending bills 
by 30th June uh, uh, 2021. Mr. Speaker, I urge the House to support our efforts towards enforcing compliance in payment of all verified pending bills by the county government by backing our proposal under Article 225 of the Constitution of Kenya to temporarily stop transfers to county government that persistently fail to comply with the directive to clear pending bills. Mr. Speaker, the financial sector has remained stable and continued to make significant contribution to the economic growth. Our commercial banks continue to expand their businesses to the neighboring markets, including recent acquisitions in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Uganda. The continued regional expansion will leverage on the trade and investment opportunities under the African continental free trade area. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, the Kenyan banking sector continued on its transformation journey that commenced five years ago, where the key pillar of the journey has been the strengthening of banks' business models, governance frameworks, and entrenching customer centricity in the operations. Mr. Speaker, at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, the banking sector moved quickly to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on staff, customers, and the public and, 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 and instituted emergency measures to support business continuity, use of digital channels to mitigate COVID-19 infection risk, enhance liquidity to businesses, as well as facilitate compliance with health and safety protocols. As a result, banks continue to provide interrupted banking services to customers mainly through digital channels. Mr. Speaker, over the last one year, more than 54% of the bank loans equivalent to Kenya shillings 1.7 trillion were restructured to enable borrowers to navigate through the hard time due to the pandemic. As we move to the recovery phase, the banking sector will be expected to play a pivotal role in supporting the recovery of enterprises. Mr. Speaker, to spur economic recovery, additional capital investments are required. In this regard, the recently established Nairobi International Financial Center Authority will play an important role and is expected to publish before end of December 2021 a framework for attracting investments and innovative financial services into our economy and the region. Mr. Speaker, the high cost of mortgages, land acquisition and housing unit has limited access to affordable housing. Nevertheless, government interventions are beginning to yield the desired results for affordable housing. Significant progress has been made to enhance efficiency, transparency, and certainty in land matters by engineering the land registration processes, digitization of land records, and implementation of the Sectional Properties Act. The government is also in the process of streamlining and simplifying the legal and regulatory process governing the housing sector and providing basic in infrastructure services to developers. Further, the Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company is supporting the growth of residential housing market in Kenya by providing long-term funding to the mortgage lenders in order to increase affordability of mortgage loans to Kenyans. As of December 2020, Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company had refinanced 1,400 affordable housing loans worth Kenya shilling 2.75 billion. Mr. Speaker, the Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company is scheduled to issue an infrastructure bond by October 2021 to raise additional financing for its affordable housing finance objective. Consequently, the company plans to issue green bonds to finance climate-friendly housing projects. Mr. Speaker, during the current financial year, the government operationalized the credit guarantee scheme by providing seed capital of financial three billion to the risk lending to micro, small, and medium enterprises. To this effect, the National Treasury signed credit guarantee agreements with seven commercial banks who have now rolled out credit to micro, small, and medium enterprises. Mr. Speaker, to further promote access to affordable credit by micro, small, and medium enterprises, the government has committed to progressively raise the capital to Kenya shilling 10 billion, 10 billion. In this budget, I propose to allocate an additional to Kenya shilling 2 billion to the scheme. Mr. Speaker, Alongside the credit guarantee scheme, 
On account of improved business environment, the private sector has rolled out other innovative credit products targeting micro, small, and medium enterprises. Through these innovations, the banking sector had dispersed over a shilling 20.8 billion to micro, small, and medium enterprises, equivalent to 0.7% of total gross loans by end of April 2021. Mr. Speaker, in order to unlock the full potential of digital lenders, the government has, through the Central Bank of Kenya Amendment Bill 2021, proposed to provide for licensing of digital credit service providers. This bill has been submitted to this House for consideration and approval. Mr. Speaker, capital markets play a critical role of channeling national savings and foreign capital inflows into the productive sectors. In order to enhance inclusivity and access to investment opportunities in the capital markets, I propose to amend the Central Depository Act to allow for opening of omnibus investment accounts by persons investing on behalf of others in the securities market. This will allow investment by individuals as well as collective investment by groups. Further, to improve efficiency in our capital markets and ensure fair administra administrative actions by the Capital Markets Authority, I propose to amend the Capital Markets Act to enable the Capital Markets Tribunal to hear and determine any appeal within 90 days. Mr. Speaker, following the Kenya Bankers Association and other industry players, we shall establish an electronic over-the-counter secondary market platform for government securities. This platform will help in deepening our domestic uh, debt market, improve pricing efficiency and transparency in securities trading thereby, lowering yields and cost of credit in the economy. We expect the operations of the of the over the counter to be in place by June 2022. Mr. Speaker, the defined benefit pension scheme for civil servants, teachers and discipline forces has constrained growth of pension savings and also exerted fiscal pressure on government. In order to address these twin problems, the government on 1st of January 2021 rolled out the much-awaited public service superannuation scheme that covers civil servants, teachers, and the discipline forces aged below 45 years at the commencement of the scheme with an option for those over 45 years to join if they elect to do so. As of April 2021, a total of 340,000 318 public servants had indeed joined the scheme. Mr. Speaker, in the past, the processing of payment or pension benefits to retired public servants has neither been efficient nor timely, thus denying senior citizens regular incomes. To address this, National Treasury has carried out targeted reforms including systems re-engineering and the provision of real-time pension services in all the Oduma centers countrywide. I'm pleased to note that as a result of these interventions, the cumulative pension payments and pension file process increased by 40% by 31st May 2021 compared to the previous year. We expect further improvement with the planned implementation of pensions management information system late in the year. Mr. Speaker, given the disparities in the design of the various existing pension schemes and the attendant laws, it has become necessary that th these laws be harmonized, hence the need for establishment of one national retirement policy. The policy currently under development seeks to achieve comprehensive pension coverage across formal and informal sectors so as to protect the interests of beneficiaries and rights, and rights of pension contributors. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I shall be publishing the policy by December 2021. Mr. Speaker, further, to enhance good governance and improve accountability and transparency in the management of retirement benefit schemes, I propose to amend the Retirement Benefits Act to provide for the registration and regulation of corporate trustees that provide services to pension schemes. Mr. Speaker, our retired citizens have continued to experience challenges in accessing Medicare. For this reason, we have developed post-retirement medical regulations 
to allow members to make additional voluntary contribution to a medical fund. This will enable retirees access the funds at the retirement or transfer a portion of it to a medical insurance provider. However, the existing regulations exclude post-retirement medical funds established under irrevocable trust by employers and service providers outside the retirement benefit scheme, popularly known as the standalone post-retirement medical funds. These funds have remained unregulated, thus adversely exposing members' funds. As such, I propose to amend the Retirement Benefits Act to provide for regulation of these funds. Mr. Speaker, majority of Kenyans in the informal se sector are not covered by any pension scheme, making them vulnerable during old age. To address this, I undertook last year to establish a national informal sector pension scheme with a sustainable model that combines long-term savings with short-term needs, targeting the more than 15 million, uh, million in the informal sector workers who have been excluded from the current pension arrangement. To this effect, I wish to report that necessary instruments to operationalize the scheme, including trust deeds and rules, business plan, and investment policy have been prepared. We intend to roll out this scheme in the next financial year. Mr. Speaker, to reinforce realization of affordable housing, last year, we amended the Retirement Benefits Act and mortgage regulations to allow members to use part of their accumulated benefits to purchase residential houses. This was support, this was support members of retirement benefit schemes to own homes. In this budget, I propose to amend the mortgage regulations to allow members to utilize up to 40% or maximum of canceling 7 million of their accrued benefits to purchase a house and a tenant purchase basis by their pension uh, scheme. Mr. Speaker, currently, foreign insurance brokers are excluded from the definition of brokers under the Insurance Act, thereby making them operate in the country without any controls thus putting insurance and policyholders at risk. To address this, I propose to amend the Insurance Act to provide for the regulation of foreign insurance brokers. Mr. Speaker, classes of long-term insurance business were amended in, 20, in 2009 to align with modern classification and bring into perspective the industry's current size. However, the permitted maximum management expenditure was not updated to match the new classification, which causes insurance to either overestimate or underestimate the management expenses, impacting negatively on policyholders. I therefore propose to amend the insurance regulations to provide for the maximum permitted expenditure for each category. Mr. Speaker, to effectively manage disaster response in a more coordinated manner, the government has developed a disaster risk management bill 2021. The objective of the bill is to better prepare and coordinate our disaster response, mitigation and recovery, as well as build resilience at both national and county levels. Given the urgency to provide a framework for disaster management at both levels of government, I appeal to this House to prioritize consideration of this bill. Mr. Speaker, climate change remains a key concern globally, given its adverse impact on economies. In this regard, Government will strengthen capacity of national and county government to plan, budget, implement, and monitor climate resilience investment. The government has partnered with development partners in the implementation of the proposed financing locally led climate action program and already mobilized funding of 10 shilling 18 billion to support the initiative over the next five years. Through this program, we shall strengthen national and county government capacities to manage climate risk through support to the county climate change units, establishment of county climate change fund, and development of climate change laws. Mr. Speaker, the government has also developed and approved the sovereign green bond framework, identified a portfolio of projects for consideration under the framework, and is prepared to issue the first sovereign green bond to raise capital to finance green projects under the economic recovery strategy. Mr. Speaker, as part of ease of doing business reforms to facilitate trade, we have finalized the development of maritime single window system under the trade net system. 
This will provide an harmonized and simplified ship-to-show clearance procedures to maritime stakeholders. The maritime single window system will also will allow shipping agents in Kenya to electronically submit vessel pre-arrival and pre-departure declarations to government agencies. The maritime single window system is expected to replace the current system that is manual, decentralized, with the necessary lengthy processes that affect the ship turnaround time and increase cost of port to Mombasa. I am pleased to know that this maritime single window system went live on 2nd June 2021. Mr. Speaker, the fiscal policy supporting the financial year 2021-2022 and the medium-term budget is designed to support economic recovery and reduce fiscal deficit. The policy aims to mobilize revenues through the ongoing reforms in tax policy and administration. On the expenditure side, the, the focus would be to rationalize non priority expenditures from the budget and align the resources to the Big Four agenda and the economic recovery strategy. Mr. Speaker, the execution of this budget for the financial 2020-21, the execution of the budget for the financial 2020-21 has progressed well, albeit with revenue underperformance and elevated expenditure associated with the adverse impact of COVID-19 pandemic. The shortfalls in revenues reflect weaker business environment and the impact of containment measures adopted in March 2020 following the outbreak of the pandemic. The government then responded to the pandemic by, among others, implementing tax relief measures in April 2020. These measures resulted in reduced collection of revenues, adversely impacting the implementation of the budget. Arising from this, the government in January 2021 made reversal of some of the relief measures, resulting in improvement in revenue collection. However, in March 2021, containment measures were introduced as a result of the third wave of the COVID-19. These measures lasted for only one year, one month. Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to reducing the level of tax exemptions to create parity of treatment, while also raising more revenues to fund social programs and reduce the fiscal deficit. In this budget, I will be proposing selected measures to expand the revenue base. Mr. Speaker, our tax policies are spread across various tax statutes, which are amended every year during the budget process, creating uncertainty in tax legislation. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I have initiated a process of developing a national tax policy framework that will not only enhance administrative efficiency of the tax system, but provide consistency and certainty in tax administration and management of tax expenditure. A draft national tax policy is now ready and will be shared with stakeholders and members of the public in line with the dictates of our constitution before forwarding to this house for consideration and approval. Mr. Speaker, total revenue including appropriation in aid and grants for the financial 2021-22 budget is projected at Kenya shilling 2.1 trillion, equivalent to 17% of GDP. Of this, total revenue is projected at Kenya shilling 2.04 trillion equivalent 16% of GDP, an increase in nominal terms from currently 1.84 trillion in the financial year 2020-21. Ordinary revenue in the budget is projected at currently 1.78 trillion, equivalent to 14.3% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, total expenditure in the financial year 2021-22 budget are projected at currently 3.0 3 trillion, equivalent 24.5% of GDP, from Kenya shilling 2.89 trillion, equivalent 25.8% of GDP in the financial 2020-21 budget. The current expenditure will amount to Kenya shilling 2 trillion, or 16.2% of GDP. On the other hand, development expenditures, including foreign finance projects, allocations to contingency fund, and conditional transfers to county government are projected at Kenya shilling 669.6 billion. These funding is expected to accelerate completion of ongoing critical infrastructure projects in the country. Mr. Speaker, 
The expenditures I've outlined in this budget are consistent with those approved in the 2021 budget policy statement. Given the performance of revenue and the available levels of funding from our development partners, it is indeed necessary that we strictly adhere to the expenditure ceilings as presented so as to manage and stabilize public debt. Mr. Speaker, given the projected revenues and grants against the projected expenditure, the fiscal deficit for the financial year 2021-22 budget is projected at 3 shillings 929.7 billion, equivalent to 7.5% of GDP. This fiscal deficit is lower than 3 shillings 976.2 billion, equivalent to 8.7% of GDP in the financial year 2020-21 budget. The fiscal deficit in 2021-22 budget will be financed through net external financing of 3 shillings 271.2 billion, equivalent to 2.2% of GDP, and net domestic financing of 3 shillings 658.5 billion, equivalent to 5.3% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, our medium-term consolidation policy aims at reducing fiscal deficit progressively to 3 shillings 613.8 billion, equivalent to 3.6% of GDP by the year 2024-25. In this respect, we shall closely monitor the impact of COVID-19 to the economy and accru 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 accordingly adjust the fiscal plan, including tax measures, to ensure that our development agenda remains sustainably funded. We shall carefully do this while limiting in-house adjustments of the budget for new projects except those of emergency nature. This will enhance certainty in the budget process and improve implementation of government programs and projects while adhering to the fiscal consolidation plan. Mr. Speaker, Kenya's public debt remains sustainable, but the debt carrying capacity has, however, declined. Financing of the fiscal deficit will continue to be strictly guided by the debt and borrowing policy and the annual medium term debt strategy. Mr. Speaker, the government is implementing reforms to strengthen the institutional arrangements of public debt management by aligning the operations of the Public Debt Management Office to the PFM Act. In this respect, decisions of the day-to-day -day management and operations of the public debt management shall be undertaken by the Public Debt Management Office to enhance efficiency, strengthen accountability, and transparency. In addition, Mr. Speaker, during this calendar year, we have scheduled a set of debt management operations to lower cost and risk in our public debt portfolio to improve on the country's debt sustainability indicators and sovereign credit rating. I look forward to support of the August House for the amendment of public debt ceiling set in the Public Finance Management Act to enable implementation of debt management operations, including financing of the fiscal deficit. Mr. Speaker, with the desire to meet our development objectives, the gap between development needs and available resources has been expanding. Underscoring the need for alternative financing mechanism, Last year, I highlighted the importance of public-private partnership as an option for closing the financing gap. The current Public-Private Partnership Act impedes expeditious financial closure of public-private partnership projects. To this effect, I undertook to transform the public-private partnership framework, which included review of legal, operational, and institutional structures. In this regard, I submitted the Public-Private Partnership Bill 2021 to this House for consideration and approval. Mr. Speaker, let me now turn to the highlights of the government spending priorities in the coming financial year. In light of the revenue challenges and significant expenditure, expenditure demands, spending the financial 2021-2022 will focus on critical areas with the highest impact on the well-being of Kenyans and support economic recovery. Therefore, the total program spending for the financial 2021-2022 excluding redemptions, amounts to current shilling 3.03 trillion. Mr. Speaker, the government will continue with the implementation of the economic stimulus program in the financial 2021-22. With regards, we target to push on vulnerable citizens and businesses, particularly those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have in this regard set aside current shilling 23.1 billion in the financial 2021-22 budget for continuation of this program. Mr. Speaker, out of this, Kenshilling 3 billion is earmarked for youth empowerment and employment creation, 
under the Kazi Mutani program, Ken Shilling 2.6 billion will go towards enhancing liquidity to businesses, Ken Shilling 6.4 billion for improving educational outcomes, Ken Shilling 6.9 billion for improving environment, water and sanitation facilities, Ken Shilling 1.97 billion for improving agriculture and food security, as well as Ken Shilling 1.2 billion for recruitment of health workers. Mr. Speaker, I have also set aside Ken Shilling 1 billion for Kenya Wildlife Services to employ community scouts. Mr. Speaker, the implementation of priority programs under, under the Big Four agenda is a critical part to supporting sustainable economic recovery and accelerating uh, employment creation. To realize this, Mr. Speaker, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 142.1 billion to support the implementation of the Big Four agenda for both drivers and enabler, enabler projects. Mr. Speaker, the outbreak and rapid spread of the COVID-19 pandemic necessitated an urgent need to upscale implementation of universal health coverage to all our counties. Towards this end, Mr. Speaker, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 121.1 billion to the health sector to support the various programs aimed at improving health outcomes. Mr. Speaker, of this amount, Kenya Shilling 47.7 billion will fund activities and programs for the attainment of universal health coverage. Mr. Speaker, specific allocations for the various activities and programs includes Ken Shilling 8.7 billion for the Kenya COVID-19 Emergency Response Project, Ken Shilling 4.1 billion for free maternity health care, Ken Shilling 7.2 billion for the managed equipment, equipment services, as well as Ken Shilling 1.8 billion to provide medical cover for the elderly and severely disabled persons in our society. To lower cases of HIV, AIDS, ma and malaria, and tuberculosis in the country, Ken Shilling 5.8 billion has been set aside. To enhance vaccines and immunization program, we've set aside Ken Shilling 3.9 billion. Further, Mr. Speaker, we propose an additional Ken Shilling 14.3 billion for purchase of COVID-19 vaccines and related expenditure in the course of the financial 2021-2022. Mr. Speaker, to enhance early diagnosis and management of cancer and reduce the burden of treatment among Kenyans, I have pro proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 450 million for procurement of cyber knife radiotherapy equipment for Kenyatta University Teaching Referral and Research Hospital. A further Kenya Shilling 350 million has been set aside for the establishment of two cancer centers in Meru and Kakamega. Further, to improve health service delivery, Kenya Shilling 15.2 billion has been set aside for Kenyatta National Hospital. Ken Shilling 11.5 billion for the Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital. Ken Shilling 7.3 billion for the Kenya Medical Training Center. Ken Shilling 2.8 billion for the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Ken Shilling 1.3 billion for the construction of Kenya National Hospital Bands and Pediatric Centers. Ken Shilling 863 million for procurement of family planning and reproductive health commodities and Kenya Shilling 600 million for procurement of equipment at the National Blood Transfusion Center. Mr. Speaker, affordable housing program is a pragmatic approach to addressing the housing problem, especially in the urban centers. To ensure success of this initiative, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 13.9 billion for the affordable housing program. The proposed allocation includes Kenya Shilling 3.5 billion to the to Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company for establishment of the company's capital as well as for own lending to primary mortgage lenders. Ken Shilling 8.2 billion for construction of affordable housing units as well as Ken Shilling 500 million for construction of social housing units. Mr. Speaker, to support the Nairobi Metropolitan Services in revising urban dignity in Nairobi County, City County, Ken Shilling 100 million has been set aside for the Nairobi Metropolitan Service Improvement Project and Ken Shilling 111.2 million for construction of footbridges. Other key allocations to the housing, urban, de urban development, and public works sector include Ken Shilling 3.5 billion for the Kenya Informal Settlement Improvement Project Phase 2, Ken Shilling 1 billion for construction of markets, Ken Shilling 1 billion for maintenance of government pool houses, Ken Shilling 750 million for construction of housing units for the National Police and Kenya prison. Kenya shilling 700 million for the Kenya urban program. Kenya shilling 200 million 
for the Africa City Summit and Kenya Shilling 445.6 million for the construction and completion of salt project building. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 700 million to support the Nairobi bus rapid transport project to offer an efficient and time saving public transport. Mr. Speaker, the government continues to scale up reforms to encourage investments in the manufacturing sector to support and protect local industries. Despite the challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, the fiscal and monetary policy measures that the government implemented significantly cushioned the sector. Mr. Speaker, to further promote local industries, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling 20.5 billion under the various implementing ministries, departments, and agencies. Out of this, Kenya shilling 2 billion will go to the Credit Guarantee Scheme to enhance access to affordable credit by micro, small, and medium enterprises in the manufacturing sector. Kenya shilling 500 million will support development of various micro, small, and medium enterprises in Kenya. And Kenya shilling 600 million for provision of finances to micro, small, and medium enterprises through the Kenya Industrial Estate. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I have set aside Kenya shilling 8.3 billion for Dongokundu Special Economic Zone, Kenya shilling 350 million for develop development of the Special Economic Zone, Textile Park in Naivasha, Kenani Leather Industrial Park, and the River Textile Hub, Kenya shilling 90 million for the Free Port and Industrial Park Special Economic Zone in Mombasa. Other proposed allocations include Kenya shilling 130.2 million for the modernization of river techs, Kenya shilling 800 million for access roads to industrial park facilities. Mr. Speaker, in order to maximize the benefits from our cash crops, the government will make further investments towards the revival and enhancement of, of output. In this respect, Mr. Speaker, I have proposed 210.4 million for coal industry revitalization. Kenya shilling 59.2 million for modernization of cooperative cotton generis, and Kenya shilling 50 million for cotton development as a subsidy and accession support. Mr. Speaker, to equip our youth and with essential training and internship opportunities, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling 1.4 billion for the Kenya Industrial and Entrepreneurship Project, Kenya shilling 800 million for the Kenya Youth Employment and Opportunities Project. Kenya shilling 448 million for industrial research laboratories. Kenya shilling 199.5 million for con constituency industrial development centers. Mr. Speaker, in order to support our aspirations of attaining 100% food security food and administration security. I have set aside Kenya shilling 60 billion to relevant programs in this budget. Out of this, Kenya shilling 7 billion will go to the National Agricultural and Rural Inclusivity Project. Kenya shilling 2.7 billion for the Kenya Cereal Enhancement Pro uh, Program. Kenya shilling 1.8 billion has been proposed for the emergency locust response. Kenya shilling 1.5 billion for the National Value Chain Support Program. Kenya shilling 1.5 billion for the Agricultural Sector Development Support Program 2. Kenya shilling 1.5 billion for the Small Scale Irrigation and Value Addition Project. And Kenya shilling 620 million for Food Security and Crop Diversification Project. Mr. Speaker, to improve livestock production, I propose Kenya shilling 3 billion for free disease holding ground in Lamu. I have also proposed Kenya shilling 488.1 million for the Regional Pastoral Livelihood Resilience Project. Kenya shilling 455 million for the Kenya Livestock Commercialization Program. Kenya shilling 163 million for the Livestock Value Chain Support Project. And Kenya shilling 156.2 million for Livestock Production and the Big Four Initiative. To enhance animal disease controls, I have set aside Kenya shilling 180 million for sustainable successful entrepreneurs free areas in Kenya. Kenya shilling 131.4 million for the disease free zones program and Kenya shilling 60 million for modernization of foot and mouth disease laboratory and related activities. Mr. Speaker, the realization of the food and nutrition security 
also relies heavily on the sustainable utilization of the blue economy resources. To promote this, I have proposed an allocation of financial shilling 3.2 billion for the aquaculture business development project. Financial shilling 3.4 billion for Kenya marine fisheries and socioeconomic development project. Financial shilling 2.1 billion for exploitation of living resources under the blue economy. Financial shilling 1 billion for construction of fish processing plant in Lamu. Ken shilling 290 million for cost of fisheries infrastructure development. Ken shilling 326.6 million for rehabilitation of fish landing sites in, Lam, in, Lake, in Victoria. Ken shilling 150 million for aquaculture technology development and innovation transfers. And Ken shilling 195.3 million for development of blue economy initiatives. Mr. Speaker, in order to increase agricultural productivity, and enhance resilience to climate change risk in targeted small smallholder farming and pastoral communities in Kenya. I have set aside Kenya shilling 8.9 billion for the Climate Smart Agricultural Productivity Project. Kenya shilling 1.1 billion to enhance drought resilience and sustainable livelihood. Kenya shilling 178 billion, million towards ending drought emergencies in Kenya. And in addition, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling 529.5 million for the livestock and crop insurance scheme to reduce the vulnerabilities of Kenyan farmers to disease and natural disasters. Mr. Speaker, to ensure legitimacy of land ownership, I have set aside Kenya shilling 1.5 billion for processing and registration of title deeds. Kenya shilling 600 million for digitization of land registries and Kenya shilling 105 million for construction of land registries. Mr. Speaker, other proposed allocations include Kenya Shilling 100 million for revitalization of cotton industry, Kenya Shilling 300 million for mitigation of fall army worms, Kenya Shilling 150 million for establishment of liquid nitrogen plant, Kenya Shilling 200 million towards the embryo transfer project, and Kenya Shilling 65 million for construction and refurbishment of the Leather Science Institute. Mr. Speaker, Having highlighted the expenditures under the Economic Stimulus Program and the Big Four Agenda Initiative, allow me to turn to other proposed areas of expenditure in this budget that will support our path to sustainable and resilient economic recovery. Mr. Speaker, the government continues to expand critical infrastructure in roads, rails, sea, and airports to create an enabling environment for economic recovery and employment creation. Towards this end, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 182.5 billion, excluding the provisions I have set aside for the Economic Stimulus Program and the Big Four Agenda to support construction of roads and bridges, as well as their rehabilitation and maintenance. Mr. Speaker, the rehabilitation of the meter gauge railway has improved interconnectivity and reduced traffic congestion on our roads. To continue improving public transport within the Nairobi metropolitan area, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 1.3 billion for railway metro, metro lines. Further, Mr. Speaker, to expand railway transport to the rest of the country, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 27.2 billion for phase two of the standard gauge railway, Kenya Shilling 2 billion for construction and rehabilitation of Na Naivasha Inland Container Depot, Malaba Line, Kenya Shilling 2 billion for construction and rehabilitation of Riruta Lenana Ngong Railway. Kenshili 1.1 billion to complete rehabilitation of the Nairobi Nanyuki meter, meter gauge railway line. And Kenshili 700 million to complete rehabilitation of the Nakuru Kisumu meter gauge railway. I have also set aside Kenshili 2 billion for the Kenya National Shipping Yard. Mr. Speaker, to support development of our ports, I have proposed an allocation of Kenshili 7.5 billion for the construction of the Mombasa Port Development Project and Kenya Shilling 7.5 billion for the Lapset project. Further, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 128 million for insurance of ferries for the Likoni Channel, Kenya Shilling 149 million for the maintenance of ferries and jet headquarters, and Kenya Shilling 603 million for construction and expansion of airports and airstrips. Mr. Speaker, to support production of reliable and affordable energy, I have set aside a total of Kenya Shilling 71.9 billion, excluding the provision set aside under the Big Four initiatives. Out of these, Kenya Shilling 50.1 billion 
will cater for transmission and distribution of power. Ken Shilling, Ken Shilling 11.3 billion for development of geothermal energy. Ken Shilling 6.4 billion for electrification of public facilities. And Ken Shilling 1.3 billion for development of nuclear energy as well as exploration and mining of coal. Mr. Speaker, enhanced national security will create an enabling environment for business to thrive while aiding faster economic recovery. In this regard, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya shilling 294.5 billion to support operation of the National Police, Defense, and the National Intelligence Service. Mr. Speaker, the proposed allocations include 119.8 billion for defense, Kenya shilling 42.5 billion for the National Intelligence Service, Kenya shilling 110.6 billion for policing and prison services. Ken Shilling 10.7 billion for leasing of police motor vehicles and Ken Shilling 1 billion for police modernization program. Mr. Speaker, to step up war on crime and enhance support for administration of justice, I have set aside Ken Shilling 1.5 billion for the national communication and surveillance system and Ken Shilling 335 million to equip the National Forensic Laboratory. Mr. Speaker, other locations include Ken Shilling 4.8 billion for medical insurance for the National Police Service and prisons. Ken Shilling 2.3 billion for the group personal insurance for the National Police and prisons, as well as Ken Shilling 1 billion for the National Integrated Identity Management System. Mr. Speaker, the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic last year disrupted in-person learning leading to closure of schools for nine months. The government is determined to recover the lost time while ensuring safe learning in our schools colleges and universities. In this respect, I have set aside a total of Ken Shilling 202.8 billion to support programs in the education sector. Mr. Speaker, out of the proposed allocation, Ken Shilling 12 billion will cater for free primary education, Ken Shilling 2.5 billion for recruitment of teachers, Ken Shilling 62.2 billion for free day secondary education, including insurance under the NHI for secondary school students, Ken Shilling 4 billion for examination fee waiver for all class 8 and form 4 candidates, and Ken Shilling 1.8 billion for the school feeding program. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I have proposed an allocation of Ken Shilling 1 billion for the competency based curriculum, and Ken Shilling 420 million for the dig digital literacy program and ICT integration in our secondary schools. Mr. Speaker, to support infrastructure development and ensure safe learning in our schools, I have proposed an allocation of Ken Shilling 4.2 billion for primary and secondary schools infrastructure and Ken Shilling 1.8 billion for construction and equipping of technical training institutes and vocational training centers. Further, Ken Shilling 1.1 billion has been set aside to increase access and, and improve the quality of technical and vocational education and training programs under the East African Skills Transformation and Regional Integration Project. Mr. Speaker, other proposed allocations in the education sector include Ken Shilling 281.7 billion to Teacher Service Commission, Ken Shilling 76.3 billion for university education, Ken Shilling 15.8 billion to the Higher Education Loans Board, Ken Shilling 5.8 billion for Kenya Secondary School Education Quality Improvement Project, and Ken Shilling 5.2 billion capitation to Tibet students. Further, Ken Shilling 745 million has been set aside for the technical vocational education training and entrepreneurship. Kenya Shilling 633 million for promotion of youth employment and vocational training, and Kenya Shilling 323 million for the National Research Fund. Mr. Speaker, when COVID-19 pandemic struck last year, we injected additional resources to the traditional cash transfer program to cushion the vulnerable in our society. To continue protecting this vulnerable segment, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling, uh, Shilling 37.8 billion for social protection and affirmative actions in this budget. Mr. Speaker, out of this allocation, Kenya Shilling 16.7 billion will cater for cash transfers to elderly persons, Kenya Shilling 7.9 billion for orphans and vulnerable children, and Ken Shilling 1.2 billion for orphans for persons living with severe disabilities. Mr. Speaker, the proposed allocation also includes Ken Shilling 4.1 billion for the Kenya Hunger Safety Net Program, 
Kenya is shilling 3.7 billion for the Kenya Development Response to Displacement Impact Project, and Kenya is shilling 2.7 billion for the Kenya Social and Economic Inclusion Project. In addition, Kenya is shilling 933.8 million will go to the Child Welfare Society of Kenya. Kenya is shilling 400 million for the presidential. Mr. Speaker, the most pressing challenge in our country at the moment is lack of job opportunities for the youth. This has been ex exacerbated by the hard economic times following the adverse impact of COVID-19 pandemic. In order to empower the youth and support businesses owned by youth, women and persons living with disabilities, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 10 billion for the National Youth Service, Kenya Shilling 2.2 billion for the Kenya Youth Empowerment and Opportunities uh, Project, Kenya Shilling 454.1 million for the Youth Enterprise Development Fund, Kenya Shilling 120 million for the Women Enterprise Fund, and Kenya Shilling 62 million for the Youth Employment and Enterprise Fund. Mr. Speaker, to promote regional equity, reduce poverty, and enhance social development, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 41.7 billion for the National Government Constituency Development Fund. Kenya Shilling 2.1 billion for the National Government Affirmative Action Fund, as well as Kenya Shilling 2.8 billion for the Equalization Fund to finance programs in the previously marginalized areas. Mr. Speaker, the rapid technological advancements portend great pot 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 uh, potential to catalyze economic recovery, create jobs, and improve livelihoods, lives and livelihoods for Kenyans. To leverage on these technological gains, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 20.9 billion to fund initiatives in the information, communication, and technology sector. Specifically, these allocations include Kenya Shilling 1 billion for government shared services, Kenya Shilling 670 million for the digital literacy program. Further, to fast track the development of the Konza Technopolis City, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 12 billion for the horizontal infrastructure phase one, Kenya Shilling 3.6 billion for Konza data center and smart city facilities, Kenya Shilling 400 million for construction of Konza complex phase 1B, and Kenya Shilling 200 million for development of Konza Technopolis master plan. Mr. Speaker, other proposed allocations include Kenya Shilling 1.2 billion for maintenance and rehabilitation of national optic fiber backbone phase two expansion cable. Kenya Shilling 1.1 billion for installation and commission, commissioning of Eldoret Nadapal fiber optic cable. And Kenya Shilling 463 million for maintenance and rehabilitation of last mile county connectivity network. Mr. Speaker, the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing containment measures significantly affected tourism, sports, culture, and arts sectors. To support recovery of these sectors, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 15 billion for the sports, arts, and social development fund. Kenya Shilling 1.7 billion for the tourism fund. Kenya Shilling 643 million for the tourism promotion fund. And Kenya Shilling 90 million for refurbishment of the regional sadia. Mr. Speaker, to expand access to clean and adequate water for domestic and agriculture use, I have proposed an allocation of Kenya Shilling 38 billion for water and sewerage infrastructure development, Kenya Shilling 16.4 billion for water resource management, and Kenya Shilling 10.8 billion for water storage and flood control. In addition, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 10.5 billion for irrigation and land reclamation and Kenya Shilling 1.6 billion for water harvesting and storage for irrigation. Mr. Speaker, in order to support environment and water conservation, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 9.6 billion for forest and water towers conservation, Kenya Shilling 3.3 billion for environment management and protection, Kenya Shilling 1.4 billion for meteorological services, and Kenya Shilling 8.2 billion for wildlife conservation and management. Mr. Speaker, to enhance good governance and scale up fight against corruption, I have set aside Kenya Shilling 3.3 billion 
for the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, cancelling 3.2 billion for the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, and cancelling 7.6 billion for the Criminal Investigation Services, and cancelling 5.9 billion for the Office of the Auditor General. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, to enhance the oversight and the legislative role of Parliament and access to justice, I propose to set aside cancelling 37.9 billion for Parliament and cancelling 17.9 billion for the judiciary. Mr. Speaker, acknowledging the place of devolution in our country, the county governments will, will receive cancelling 370 billion as equitable share representing 27.3% of the most recent audited and approved revenue raised nationally in line with Article 2032 of the Constitution. In addition, the county governments would receive pension shilling 7.5 billion as conditional allocation from the national government share of revenue and pension shilling 32.3 billion from development partners, bringing the total allocation of the county government for the financial 2021-22 to pension shilling 409.9 billion. Indeed, this marks a, a substantial increase compared to cancelling 353.2 billion allocation in the financial 2020-21. A clear testimony of the government's commitment to supporting devolution. Mr. Speaker, in line with the High Court ruling on petition number 252 of 2016, directing that conditional and unconditional grants to county government should not be provided for under the Division of Revenue Act, the National Treasury is in consultation with other stakeholders is developing an appropriate legal instrument to be used to, to disburse additional conditional grants from the national government's share of revenue, as well as from proceeds of loans and grants to county government. Mr. Speaker, in February 2020, the national government and the national city county government entered into a mutual agreement in line with Article 187 of the Constitution, through which the Nairobi city county transferred some of its functions to the national government. To ensure that the process of such a transfer of functions is fully reinforced in law, the National Treasury is developing a legislation to operationalize at Articles 187 and 189 of the Constitution on transfer of functions and cooperation between the national and county governments. Mr. Speaker, to facilitate performance of the transferred functions by the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, I propose to allocate cash shilling to 7.2 billion, which will comprise 18 billion for recurrent expenditure and cash shilling 9.2 billion for development expenditure. Mr. Speaker, to support county governments' capacities to enhance their own source revenue and reduce our reliance on equitable share, the National Treasury rolled out a national wide capacity building exercise for county governments on interventions contained in the national policy to support enhancement of county government on source revenue. Mr. Speaker, the policy proposes broadening of the revenue basis while enhancing counties' revenue administrative capacities. The policy further proposes a legal framework to ensure that the county governments comply with Article 2, 209 5 of the Constitution of Kenya when formulating their revenue raising measures. In this regard, we resubmitted the, the county government's revenue raising process bill 2020 to this House in early 2020 for consideration. It is my hope that this bill will get necessary priority and approval. Further, Mr. Speaker, the government through a multi-agency task force has reviewed existing revenue management system with a view to deploying one integrated county revenue management system for use by all the 47 county government. The task force has completed its work and made appropriate recommendations for consideration by the two levels of government. Mr. Speaker, in line, in order to provide basic services to the previously marginalized areas, as envisioned under the Constitution of Kenya, the concerned county governments have been allocated Kenya shilling 600, I'm, sorry, Kenya shilling 6.8 billion under the Equalization Fund in the financial year 2021-22. Mr. Speaker, arising from the High, high Court ruling declaring the Equalization Fund guidelines unconstitutional, the National Treasury has developed the public Finance Management Regulations 2021, which is now before this House for consideration. Mr. Speaker, I will now turn to taxation policy measures for the financial 2021-22 budget.
I will begin by highlighting some of the key measures on custom duty as agreed during the East African Community Partner State pre-budget consultation in May 2021. I'll then highlight some of the proposed amendments in the various tax laws relating to tax administration. These amendments are contained in the Finance Bill 2021 that I submitted to this House in April 2021 for consideration and approval. Mr. Speaker, the custom measures agreed by the South African Community Partner States and the proposed amendments in the Finance Bill 2021 are expected to generate an additional cash 8.7 billion to the Exchequer for the financial 2021-2022 budget. On custom duties, Mr. Speaker, during the South African Community Pre-Budget pre Meeting, the Ministers noted with concern the proliferation of cheap imports into the region and agreed on measures to protect locally manufactured products from unfair competition. The agreed measures under customs shall become effective from 1st July 2021. Mr. Speaker, to sustain the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, East African partner states have agreed to extend the duty-free importation window for raw materials and inputs for manufacture of masks, sanitizers, ventilators, and personal protective equipment remission for a further one year. Mr. Speaker, over, over the years, we have developed sufficient capacity for local manufacturing the metal and allied subsector. This has generated job opportunities for our youth. However, the local manufacturers in this subsector continue to face stiff competition from cheaper imports. In this regard, and in order to continue protecting this, this subsector, the South African partner states agreed that imported iron and steel products shall continue attracting a duty rate of 25% with the corresponding specific rates for a, a further one year. Mr. Speaker, our farmers have been working hard to produce enough food to satisfy demand in the region. In particular, the sector has been meeting local demands for vegetable products, including potatoes, peas, and tomatoes, among others. To protect these farmers and the sector from cheap imports, the South African Partner States agreed that vegetable products, including potatoes, peas, tomatoes, among others, shall attract a duty rate of 30% for one year as we await the finalization of the, of the review of the South African Community Common External Tariff. Mr. Speaker, baby diapers are essential products and there is need to supply them at affordable prices. In this regard, last year we allowed manufacturers to access inputs for manufacture of baby diapers duty-free and a duty remission scheme. This was meant to support Kenya's capacity to manufacture these products locally and create jobs. I am happy to know that many companies have responded to these incentives by increasing production. In order to nurture the growth of this industry and to continue sustaining the smiles of our babies, we have agreed to extend the duty-free importation of imports, inputs for manufacture of baby diapers for a further one year. Mr. Speaker, Kenya has sufficient raw material for manufacture of leather and footwear products. In support of this sector, the government has imposed a duty of 25% on imported products for manufacture of leather and footwear, and footwear products. However, the sector continues to face competition for imported products due to undervaluation, thereby discouraging investments in the sector. To this effect, and in order to enhance incomes of our farmers, the East African Community Partner States have agreed to retain the import duty of imp on imported products for manufacture of leather and, and footwear products at 25% and introduce a further specific duty rate to guard against undervaluation. Mr. Speaker, our micro, small, and medium enterprises that operate in the Jokali sector have continued to thrive, creating jobs and incomes to millions of families. Of particular interest is the furniture industry that has continued to attract local artisans who have been able to provide high quality products. However, the industry continues to face stiff competition for imported finished products, sometimes of low quality. In this regard, the South African Community Partner States agreed to extend the applicable import duty on furniture at the rate of 35% for a further one year. Mr. Speaker, to give impetus to the affordable housing programs and facilitate availability of locally made roofing tiles at affordable prices, East African Community Partner States agreed to extend for a further one year 
the duty-free window for importing inputs for the manufacture of roofing tiles under the duty remission scheme. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the proposed amendments to the, to the Income Tax Act. Mr. Speaker, to ensure equity and fairness in taxation, I have proposed to align the Income Tax Act with international best practice, through which provisions, introduction of provisions to prevent tax-based erosion and profit shifting as well as restrict treaty benefits to curb tax evasion and avoidance. In this respect, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to expand the definition of the term permanent establishment so as to align the Income Tax Act with the international best practice. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Act 2020 introduced the digital service tax on income earned through the digital marketplace. However, the current tax provision do not cover all traders who use the digital service platform to transact their business. In this regard, I propose to expand the scope of the digital service tax to include income derived from internet and electronic networks. Further, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to align the rate of withholding tax on service fees in the extractive industry with that withheld in respect of management and professional services under the same sector. This will remove ambiguity and manipulation that result in leakage of tax revenue through re characterization of income. Mr. Speaker, the private contribution made to insurance companies enjoy tax relief. However, the contribution to the National Health Insurance Fund do not enjoy this relief, despite the fund being the largest medical cover for majority of Kenyans under the universal health healthcare. In order to support the contributors and encourage more non-registered persons to join the fund, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to allow the contribution to the National Health Insurance Fund qualify for tax relief at the rate of 15 percent of, of the contributed amount. Mr. Speaker, the Income Tax Act provides for a tax rebate to employers who offer internship to a minimum of 10 university graduates for a period of one year. These employers are allowed to deduct from their taxable income an extra 50 percent out of the cost of the apprenticeship enrollment. In order to encourage employers to provide similar opportunities for TVET graduates, I propose an amendment to the Income Tax Act to include graduates of TVET institutions under the program. Accordingly, employers who engage a minimum of 10 graduates from both universities and TVET institutions will be allowed to deduct from their taxable income an extra 50% out of the cost of apprenticeship enrollment. It is my hope that employers will take advantage of this incentive and give our young graduates from Tibet institutions opportunities to gain practical experience so as to expand their employability. Mr. Speaker, last year, we revised the investment allowance regime under the second schedule to include tax act to introduce a new re regime and retain the reducing balance method of deduction. However, under this method, deduction rarely gets exhausted. In order to cure this problem, I propose to amend the Income Tax Act to replace the reducing balance method with the straight line method, which provides definite timeline for the deductions. This will provide satanity in taxation, ease, administra ease tax administration, and enhance compliance. Mr. Speaker, we have noted that the current provisions in the deductibility of interest allow some taxpayers to manipulate their balance sheets to reduce their tax liabilities. I therefore propose to replace the current thin capitalization rule that is based on debt to equity ratio with interest restrictions based on a ratio of earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Accordingly, any interest paid in excess of 30% of a company's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization will be disallowed in determination of taxable income. Mr. Speaker, in addition to being an international best practice, these measures have been found to be a better indicator of an economic performance of businesses, hence appropriate for determining the deductibility of interest on loans. 
This will guard against tax planning. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the proposed amendment under the Value Added Tax Act. In order to strengthen our healthcare system, make the cost of medicines affordable for Kenyans, and step up the fight against COVID-19 pandemic, I propose to introduce VAT exemption on medicaments used in our health facilities, including decongestants and food supplements. I further, I propose to provide VAT exemptions to diagnostic and laboratory reagents, artificial respirators, including therapeutic respiratory respiration apparatus, breathing appliances, gas masks, as well as medical equipment and technologies used in the provision of medical care services. It is my hope that the suppliers of this me medicament and medical equipment will reciprocate by making their prices affordable. Mr. Speaker, in order to co promote local manufacturing of pharmaceutical products, I also propose to introduce VAT exemption on inputs used in the manufacture of medical ventilators and breathing appliances. This will enhance access to these products that are essential in management of the COVID-19 complications. Mr. Speaker, despite the huge potential for mineral and petroleum resources in the country, exploration and mining sector remains underdeveloped due to huge capital outlay requirements. In order to promote exploration and mining activities in the country, I propose to exempt from VAT goods for inclusive use in geothermal or oil exploration and mine prospecting. Mr. Speaker, to boost Kenya's effort on green energy, I propose to exempt from VAT equipment, from VAT equipment for generation of solar and wind energy. Mr. Speaker, to provide a transition clause to allow companies that had already signed power purchase agreements with government, I propose to amend the Value Added Tax Act to provide for a transition for the project that had been signed before April 2020 to enable them to continue benefiting from the VAT exemption in respect of taxable goods used in the, in the project. This transition will expire upon completion of the said project. Mr. Speaker, in order to entrench the benefit of affordable housing, including specialized facilities like the student hostels, is imperative to develop innovative financing alternatives. In this regard, I propose to exempt from VAT asset transfers in the Real Estate Investment Trust and asset back securities. This will deepen our capital markets by encouraging investors to participate in the Real Estate Investment Trust. Mr. Speaker, as I turn to the proposed amendments to the Excise Duty Act, the Finance Bill, the Finance Act 2020, removed excise duty on betting. The removal of this tax generated a lot of public debate. Considering that betting has become widespread in our society, resulting in negative social effects. In this regard, I propose to reintroduce excess duty on betting at the rate of 20% of the amount of agat. Mr. Speaker, innovations in the tobacco, tobacco industry has led to introduction of new products such as nicotine pouches. These new products do not fall in the classification of tobacco products existing in the Excise Duty Act and are therefore currently not subject to taxation. In this regard, I propose excise duty on products containing nicotine or nicotine substitutes at a specific rate of 5, 5 per gram. This rate of excise duty is equivalent to the duty applicable to similar products under this Act. Mr. Speaker, to support the growth of service industry, particularly e-commerce, I propose to amend the Excise Duty Act so as to provide a rebate on the excise duty paid on internet data by a person who purchases the data in bulk for resale. Mr. Speaker, on the proposals to ease tax administration, Kenya ratified and deposited the multilateral, multilateral convention for mutual administration assistance in tax matters with the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information on Tax Matters in July 2020. <clears throat> this convention is meant to facilitate automatic exchange of tax information between Kenya Revenue Authority and other jurisdictions. In this regard, I have proposed amendments to the Tax Pro Procedure Act 
2015 to facilitate the implementation of the Convention. The Convention will also enhance tax compliance by foreign taxpayers and act as a deterrent to tax evasion and illicit financial flows. In addition, I propose to amend the Tax Procedures Act to empower the Kenya Revenue Authority to seek intervention of other agencies to facilitate compliance with the provisions of the Digital Service Tax. Mr. Speaker, there are various ways that some unpatriotic individuals are using to evade payments of their tax liabilities. For example, we have noted in our iTax system perennial non-compliant taxpayers, defaulters, payment returns without payment, non-filers, nil filers, credit filers, stop filers, and decliners. In addition, there are traders and merchants who are not registered at all for tax purposes. Mr. Speaker, to gather information on tax malpractices, last year, we introduced the I whistle a platform that enables members of the public to volunteer information. As at the end of April 2021, the iWhistle platform had received a total of 502 whistle whistles, and we thank the public for volunteering useful information. Considering the complexities and changing dynamics of intelligence gathering and to empower the Kenya Revenue Authority card tax malpractice, I propose to amend the Kenya Revenue Authority Act to increase the maximum reward to a person who provides information leading to the identification of an assessed taxes from cancelling 100,000 to cancelling 500,000. Further, I propose to increase the reward to a person who provides information leading to recovery from maximum of cancelling 2 million to cancelling 5 million. This will encourage receipt of voluntary information to Kenya Revenue Authority, thereby bolstering tax compliance and revenue collections. Mr. Speaker, the Tax Appeals Tribunal has been hearing tax disputes and providing judgments at a very slow pace as the tribunal sits on a part-time basis. This has, left, this has left a huge backlog of pending cases before the tribunal. Currently, there are 549 pending cases with a revenue implication of financially 107.4 billion. In order to strengthen the tribunal and allow members to expeditiously hear and conclude cases, I have proposed various amendments to the Act through Tax Appeals Tribunal, Bill 2021, which I have submitted to this House for consideration. I ask the House to prioritize this bill so as to facilitate faster disposal of tax appeals to enable us boost revenue collection. Mr. Speaker, the processing of applications under the ESC duty remission scheme has been manual, time-consuming, and inefficient. In order to improve administration of the scheme, the government automated the process under the single window system and successfully rolled out in September 2020. Mr. Speaker, to strengthen the administration of tax exemptions process for official aid funded projects, we have embarked on automation of the application and approval under the single window system and target to roll out in the next financial year. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, I must say that the preparation of these budgets required a lot of balancing. It has not been an easy process, considering the prevailing weak business environment. I am confident that the plans I have laid in this budget will be realized to achieve the envisaged economic recovery that will lead to improvement of the welfare of Kenyans. Mr. Speaker, it's worthy to note that our president has steered our economy through one of the most difficult periods occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic. His leadership and commitment to protection of lives and livelihoods through implementation of host of measures have not only reduced the fatalities caused by COVID-19, but also supported economic activities. Mr. Speaker, the budget I presented today has articulated additional measures that the government plans to undertake to further boost economic recovery. In light of the challenges in mobilization of additional revenue and rising expenditure demands, Spending the next year's budget will focus on critical areas with the highest impact on the well-being of Kenyans. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I sincerely thank His Excellency 
President Uru Kenyatta for his wise counsel and failing support and guidance, not only during the budget preparation process, but also in the stewardship of the economy. I also thank my fellow cabinet secretaries, the various accounting officers and staff for their contributions to the financial 2021-22 budget process. Mr. Speaker, I also express deep gratitude to Kenyans for the insightful contributions, proposals, and suggestions that help us to finalize this budget. In addition, my appreciation also goes to FAST, the Honorable Speakers of the National Assembly and the Senate, the majority and minority leaders, as well as other leadership of the House and their respective class for overseeing the approval of the budget estimates for the financial 2021-22 and the related documents. Second, to honorable members of the Budget and Appropriation Committee, the Finance and National Planning Committee, and other departmental committees of this House, as well as the staff of the Parliamentary Service Budget Office, for their constructive input during the approval process of the budget. Third, in a very special way, I give tribute to my incredible selfless team at the National Treasury and planning who have worked tirelessly for very long hours to ensure that these budget and supporting documents were prepared in time as per their legal requirements. Fourth, the management and staff of Kenya Revenue Authority, Central Bank of Kenya, the Attorney General's Office, Commission of Revenue Allocation, Financial Sector Regulators, and the various agencies under the National Treasury and planning for their contributions and advice during the budget, during the budget process. Fifth, our multilateral development partners, especially International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and all other bilateral development partners for their contribution to our development agenda through various technical and financial support. Further, I thank the private sector for their resilience and continued contribution to the economic development of this country. Sixth, my appreciation goes to the Fourth Estate for the active reporting on economic and financial development, as well as engagement on the financial year 2021 and 2022 budget process. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, I remain grateful to my family for their unfailing support, regular encouragement, and understanding as I steer my responsibility at the National Treasury and planning at a critical time like this. I thank you all and may God bless Kenya. Mr. Speaker, before I resume my seat, you recall in April 2021, I submitted to this House the budget estimates and the Finance Bill 2021, together with accompanying documents as required by the Public Finance Management Act 2012. Today, I further submit the following documents to this August House and request that you graciously receive them. One, the budget statement for the financial 2021-22. Two, budget policy statement 2021, estimates of revenue, grants, and loans for the financial 2021-22 budget. Four, financial statement for the financial 2021-22 budget. Five, medium-term debt management strategy 2021. Sixth, budget highlights the Monenchi Guide for the financial 2021-22, and lastly, statistical annex to the budget statement for the financial 2021-2022. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. members, uh, I wish to thank the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury and Planning for having made this public pronouncement on the budget highlights of the national, uh, for the national government for the financial year 2021-2022 and the medium term and the revenue raising measures. And as you know, our members, uh, today's budget speech will not be accompanied by the usual parliamentary courtesies given the limitations occasioned by the prevailing uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the attendant Ministry of Health's guidelines regarding public meetings. In this regard, upon adjournment of the House, 
and exit of the speaker's procession from the chamber, all guests are asked to depart the precincts of parliament at their own pleasure. However, arrangements have been made for a modest press conference by the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury at Parliament Gardens. All members may also take the opportunity to address the media on matters pertaining to the budgets in the usual manner at the Parliamentary Gardens. Now, honourable members, time being five minutes past five, the House now stands adjourned until Tuesday, 15th of June 2021 at 2.30 p.m. At the end of this afternoon's uh, session from the National Assembly, whose highlight was delivery of the public pronouncement of the budget highlights and revenue raising measures by none other than Cabinet Secretary, National Treasury and uh, Planning, Ambassador Ukur Yatani, a 3.66 trillion shillings budget, which he says was arrived at after much consultations with stakeholders, and uh, which has been delivered under the rallying call of job creation through continued and sustained economic growth. It has highlighted a number of um, priorities, policy priorities, including implementation of the Big Four Agenda uh, Health, under which the COVID-19 pandemic falls, and uh, education. Uh, which is a big one for the current government. A live broadcast brought to you by the Parliamentary Broadcasting Unit in conjunction with the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. At this point, we bring this to an end. We shall connect next week on the 15th of June. It will be a Tuesday afternoon when the National Assembly resumes sittings, which will be guided by a reviewed calendar that will see them having an afternoon sitting as well as an evening sitting on that Tuesday. My name is Vereso Mwanga. On behalf of the entire crew here, it is goodbye and back to Broadcasting House. KBC Channel 1 Chini ya uongozi wa Rais Uhuru Kenyatta, wekezaji katika sekta ya kilimo unaendelea kuisaidia nchi hii kuafikia malengo yake ya uzalishaji chakula cha kutosha. Wiki hii kwenye Project 254. Serikali walipokuja kuintroduce kazi ya, ya visima, tukakuwa nafuu kwa sababu hata mfugo wetu wamepata maji. 
tukarudi na tuka introduceiwa kasi ya ukulima na maji mimi nimekuja nimefanya kasi hapa shambani kwa sababu mmetusaidia nipate pesa mtoto arudi shuleni kwa sababu nimefaidika kwa hisi mashamba wenzetu wametuletea elimu kumbe ardhi inaweza toa hata ngombe mingi kushinda hata ile tulikuwa tunafuga alhamisi sambili na nusu jioni kwenye runinga ya KBC Channel 1on better that is the theme for this year's budget you know uh, which is carried from uh, uh, the events of 2004 when um, a serious tsunami uh, ravaged many parts of East Asia and that is what uh, the National Treasury is building on this year even as the country grapples with COVID-19 pandemic well, uh, we are talking now to the majority. Excuse me. The mother. She's the mother. Yeah, um, well, you have heard it all from uh, uh, the cabinet secretary in charge of National Treasury, uh, Ukuri Yatani, about, um, you know, the proposals that he has outlined uh, in a bit to uh, ensure that uh, the country keeps uh, keeps running. And I'm, I'm, I'm joined by uh, the majority leader in the National Assembly uh, and former finance minister, Amos Kimunya. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here. I mean, uh, having been there and done that as a former finance minister, uh, do you see any striking uh, differences between uh, how you were doing business then and how uh, Ambassador Ukuri Yatani has done it today? I think the, the, the main difference between then and now is the circumstances under which the budgets are being prepared. Uh, in my days, we were doing it when the economy was on the boom, uh, but now we are doing it when the economy is on the decline because of mainly the COVID. And COVID has not just affected Kenya, it's affected globally. So tourists will not come to Kenya because they're affected elsewhere. You know, flights are not, uh, you can't sell our produce to Europe because of COVID. So we are in a very tight situation and we have to do some balancing. Um, you know, expenditure has to go up to crank up the economy, to support the health sector, yet revenue has gone down and also people are not quite keen on borrowing. So it, it's quite a balancing act and I think the Treasury has done their best. Um, it's also a political, you know, uh, the last term, the last budget effectively of, 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 of the current uh, president. So there are some things that need to be finished and finalized before he can hand over, you know, uh, power, and that's where the agenda for uh, items, and which have received some some funding. So it's, it's quite a tight thing, but um, uh, you know, by and large, uh, I'm happy with the the way the Treasury has managed to, and uh, CS Yatani has managed to balance the, uh, the the various competing forces. I want to take you back to the year 2008 when you were the finance minister, and uh, the country was reeling uh, 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 from a very serious um, uh, uh, tribal uh, as well as political clashes. And you stood in front of this house and you said that uh, you know the measures that you are going to outline were all meant uh, to ensure there is uh, economic growth and ensure there was social stability. Uh, the, the, the current 
and CS uh, is also has also done the same uh, under very serious and extreme circumstances because of COVID-19. Are you convinced that uh, the measures he has outlined will, number one, develop, uh, drive economic growth, and number two, ensure that there is social stability? Yes, there will be. And, and remember, in 2008, the problem was in Kenya. Globally, there was no problem. Well, our clashes, you're also coming from, coming clashes, from, uh, our clashes, but our clashes were within Kenya. The global financial meltdown came um, after 2008, and there were measures for that. But uh, in this case, we have the global problem. It's affecting everyone. So whatever side you want to grow, you know, you got to know growing as fast. It's our export uh, market. But the, the, the beauty with uh, what we have now is COVID has hit us. It's brought everything down. But the economy is on the up. We grew at less than 3% last year, but now we're expecting about 6%, right? So things are on the up. On a global basis, things are on the up. Uh, and hence, we will recover, yeah, without any social tensions. The little social tensions that we are having now is because the youth are feeling, you know, they don't have money. But those are things that will go over time, right? So I'm actually optimistic that the measures that have been put in place would actually yield uh, higher incomes, higher growth, and um, barring any social tension that might come with the politicization and radicalization of the youth, we should be good to go. We should be good to you. Um, let me hear from you as an accomplished uh, accountant. Um, what would you have done differently uh, from how uh, Ambassador Kujatani has done it today? Um, actually, there isn't much choice. When you look at it, there isn't much choice in terms of what, what, uh, what he's done. And we've been also been part of it, and we've been consulting. Um, so he's, he's done about the best that there is to do. Um, I can't zero out and say there's something he has done that I would not have done, or there's something he has left out that I would have included, right? Um, there will be a bit of emphasis or tweaking here and there, but generally, I think he's uh, he, he would have, he's done as much as I could have done. It's a very difficult year. Not just for, for Kenya, not just for Yatani, but for all the finance managers, especially within the developing countries. With this so-called trilemma of, yeah? It's not just a dilemma now, it's a trilemma, yeah? There's extra demand for services, extra demand for expenditure, uh, there's less income, and there's pressure not to borrow, right? So to balance those three is, is, is very difficult. Yeah. And, and also the budget is also um, likely to come under very severe fiscal pressures, uh, bearing in mind that, uh, you know, there are plans to borrow about uh, 624 billion shillings from the domestic market, as well as, uh, as about uh, 235 billion shillings from the international market. Uh, with this kind of plans, what impact are, you likely, are we likely to see from the domestic market, especially on private borrowing? No, I think there's enough money in the in the in the in the financial markets to absorb uh, 600 uh, billion without crowding out the private sector. Um, right now, banks are actually not lending as much as they should. So, and we've been borrowing about the same number anyway. So, and there'll be lots of rolling over. So, I'm not expecting an extra 600 billion to crowd out anyone. And also, there's some. Um, things that have been done, for example, the micro and small enterprises, we have the credit guarantee scheme that is there to shield them from, you know, from the impact of, uh, of uh, adverse borrowing. Um, there's also monies that have gone towards the youth funds and all that, so they are not competing with the banks, with the, with the big corporates or with the bank, with the government in the borrowing. So in terms of our, our inflation, in terms of our macroeconomic variables, we should not be worried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think Kenyans spending for nothing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've gone through us. And if we can concentrate on containing the COVID, and uh, then we can have the economy back to work, um, this economy will revamp and grow at a phenomenal rate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something else significant that has come out of um, uh, uh, the budget speech is the, the fact that uh, you know, the government appears to be putting some brakes on um, what you call uh, uh, construction of mega project. And uh, the, 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 the CS has actually uh, announced that uh, you know, going forward, uh, the emphasis will be put on uh, completing some of the uh, ongoing projects. Uh, what impact is li this likely to have, bearing in mind that uh, you know, we are an economy that has become accustomed to uh, 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 big and mega projects. You see, new, new projects, especially towards the end of our you know, presidential term, you know, could end up leading, with, leading to stall projects after the term. So the concentration should ideally be 
complete all the projects that are in process because stalled projects can be very expensive for the economy. Uh, let's complete those before we embark on, on grand new ones. Yeah. Very well. Thank you so very much. Asante Sana. We'll keep in touch and all the best. Asante Sana. Uh, that's, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the CS in charge of, um, uh, well, not the CS, but uh, uh, the majority uh, leader in the national uh, parliament, uh, you know, uh, giving us his highlights and uh, issues around uh, what uh, the CS has said. Uh, now we are also joined by another member of parliament. Kindly tell us who you are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a member of parliament for Matungu. That's Mwashimiwa uh, Nabulindo. And Karib. Uh, yes. uh, so as a member of parliament for uh, uh, representing, you know, uh, your constituency, what would you say is um, your takeaway home or your, something that stands out for you now? Actually, um, today I'm a very disappointed person, a very, a very disappointed man because uh, uh, the budget has not actually addressed the plight of the people of my region. Uh, one of the major concerns of the people of Matungu and the surrounding uh, communities is actually the revival of the, the sugar sector. Uh, the sugar sector uh, has been on the talk for the, quite some time, but unfortunately, I have not seen or heard anything from the, this budget that goes towards the revival of the uh, sugar industry and more so a uh, revival of Mia Sugar Company. Mm -hmm. We have not seen anything that actually addresses the farmers and their plight about uh, the, uh, the farming of uh, cane. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, further, when you see uh, like the young people, the youth of this country, they depend on uh, motorbikes and border border for their daily income. Mm -hmm. But you can see this is something that actually the minister has put more tax on, on it. So it means the motorbikes are going to be more expensive than uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is uh, uh, not very good for, for us. Uh, myself, I live in uh, Matungu and I know 90% of the young people in Matungu depend on border border or motorbike for their incomes. So if it actually increases in terms of the purchasing price and the taxes have increased, then actually we are disadvantaging uh, very many youth who otherwise have gotten employment through uh, that kind of uh, uh, system where they buy a motorbike and use the motorbike for transport system. But, but it's also worth to note that, uh, you know, one of the issues that has been outlined by the CS yes. is the fact that, uh, you know, to encourage yes. uh, the assembling of uh, uh, motor mo motorbikes uh, locally, yes. uh, uh, they are going to uh, exempt some parts of uh, motorbikes, you know, from yes. from 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 excise duty. Yes. Uh, you don't think this is likely to spur more uh, uh, investment in uh, the assembling of moto mo motorbikes in Kenya? Yeah, uh, of course. At uh, that level, it's going to spur a lot of uh, development and employment of uh, young people or job creation at that level. But now, when you go at the user level, that's what I'm dealing with. Uh, the user level is where the uh, the young people go to the shop and buy a motorbike that is ready and they put it on the uh, road so that they can get income to feed their families and educate their children. Uh, that's something that has not been addressed. And uh, general, of course, uh, uh, I allowed the minister for putting austerity measures in place to, ca to help Wanainchi with the COVID uh, uh, recovery processes. But... Uh, generally, we need more impetus in terms of uh, generating in, uh, generating job opportunities for the youth of this country. Very well. Thank, Thank you, thank you so very much indeed for your time you. as a member of parliament for Matungu, uh, giving his input uh, in regard to the uh, just outlined budget a statement by the CS in charge of National Treasury, Uku Yatani. And um, we continue to gather more reactions from uh, uh, members of parliament on what exactly they make of this speech and what they think think about uh, uh, whether it is likely to spur more economic growth going forward. And now joining us uh, is also another uh, member of parliament. Kindly let us know who you are. 
Uh, my name is Richard, Honorable Richard Nyaga Katongi, Member of Parliament, Nyaribar Chacha constituency in Kise County. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry. Y yes, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've listened keenly to what the Minister has to say about the budget, and of course there are many areas of concern, and uh, as a country, uh, there are some things he's pointed out which, are, which I think will make a difference. There are things we are not comfortable with, and most of those that we are not comfortable with, we'll be able to address them uh, through the finance bill, which is coming in last week, next week, in Parliament. Because that's where we get to know how he's planning to raise the kind of money he's planning to raise. Mm -hmm. uh, we have heard um, that about uh, uh, 11 billion shillings will go to uh, um, you know, the mitigation of COVID-19. Uh, uh, number one, do you think this is, if th this is, this is um, enough, bearing in mind that uh, you know, experts are warning that we are likely to go through another f uh, fourth wave, which is likely to be more debilitating to the Kenyan economy? Uh, true. Uh, uh, he indicated there will be 11 billion for, for, for COVID. But, but again, we all know that uh, there's nothing like enough. Uh, le enough is a relative term, depending on where you are looking at it from. Uh, at least there's a provision for the same. Uh, my, my, my take is that maybe there will be a supplementary budget coming in shortly after, if we ever get to get the fourth wave because the 11 period certainly is not enough to address those things. But of concern, if you listen to Kenyans, our biggest concern they have is that even if we provide for uh, 11 billion or whatever amount it is, is it going to be used prudently, having in mind the cases of KEMSA and, uh, and what happened, what's alleged to have happened in KEMSA uh, saga. So we are hoping this will not be another KEMSA and uh, we, we will support the government to ensure that they take care of the poor, they take care of the Kenyans because Kenyans are the taxpayers, they are the owners of Kenya and they have, uh, they have, got, they have got legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I liked what the minister said about gambling about betting because uh, gambling has destroyed the society in my view you we have raised a community a generation of kenya a generation of kenyans who believe that they can wake up one morning and become pioneers or millionaires or pioneers uh, just by gambling just by guesswork mm -hmm. that's not how to build a society we need to inculcate the values of hard work in our people and the way to inculcate those hard values is by ensuring that kenyans are working hard they're in their farms kenyans are those who are working wherever you are working, you are doing your genuine hard working in you know work without without hoping for a miracle. If the windfall comes, that would be okay. And uh, so the minister for having provided 20 percent, I think for me uh, is a good thing. Uh, in itself, it communicates the message that the gambling is a short lived way of survival. Is, a, is not the way to live and uh, we need to think long term and as a country we have a duty as leaders to ensure that uh, we are putting those values and that vision in our youths because then we are going to be sure that it tomorrow we'll have a better country to live on. Thank you so very much indeed for your time. I appreciate it. That is uh, uh, Mweshimua Tongi talking to us and of course giving us his input in regard to the uh, budget speech, uh, speech that has just been uh, read by uh, Ambassador Ukur Yatani, the CS for National Treasury. Well, we're giving you these kind of reactions which we are live from uh, the National Assembly uh, outside, um, you know, what we used to call uh, the Parliament Gardens. Of course, today we don't have... Uh, uh, refreshment because of uh, the situation that we are in as a country, COVID-19 pandemic. Well, we now take you back to Broadcasting House uh, for the rest uh, of the analysis. Kifungu yako, 
Chomoka na mali yako. Kujiunga na QuickBid ni rahisi. Enda kwenye Mpesa, bonyeza Paybill kisha weka business number 4032353. Kwenye account weka kodi bidhaa unayotaka na bid yako ya chini zaidi. Kwa mfano TV16. Kisha weka shilingi 20 tu kama idadi yako. Weka bid yako pia kwenye www.quickbid.co.ke. Kumbuka, bid ya chini zaidi ya kipekee ndio ununua. QuickBid, bidhaa bora kwa bei ya chini. The greatest rally in the world is back in Kenya. Catch all the action of WRC Safari Rally live and exclusive on KBC Channel 1 from 24th to 27th June. See the world's best drivers navigate their machines on Kenya's rough terrain at breakneck speeds. Experience the thrills, adrenaline, drama and excitement as man and machine do battle. Don't miss out. WRC Safari Rally live and exclusive on KBC Channel 1. Your true sports partner. Tonight on KBC Channel 1. <laughs> <laughs> Will you marry me? Jatian is your son, and he always will be. What if he goes down the wrong road?